so I think you need to share your screen. Oh, you have. Fantastic. Over to you. You're still muted at the moment. Yes, so. there we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for the invitation and um, for this opportunity to uh, visit, uh, well, to not visit South Africa, but at least to, to speak to all of you from uh, from Oxford about uh, a work um, that we just put on the archive this morning and uh, it's part of an ongoing uh, project. So I will try to summarize the general logic. So this is work um, in collaboration with um, Sakura Shafernameki and Yinan Wang, both at Oxford. And uh, the, what this talk is generally about is about the so-called geometric engineering of superconformal quantum field theories in, uh, in dimension less than six here with eight supercharges at uh, singularities in, in string theory or M theory. So we have gen in those theories, then typically we have both a Coulomb branch and a X branch on the Coulomb branch. Uh, so we have a conformal field theory, which has some Coulomb branch operators that can acquire VEV. And then the low energy dynamics is a bunch of photons and their partners or we can have X branch, which can have some interesting uh, degrees of freedom attached on top of free hypers. Um, and both of the, I mean, any of those, um, the, many of those can be engineered in, in type 2B or uh, type 2A string theory or in M theory, as we'll review. So in the first part of the talk, I will focus on the 5D and equal one superconformal field theories, which uh, arise in, in this picture as at uh, canonical singularities in, in uh, M theory. Um, and in the second part of the talk, I will discuss similarly uh, the superconformal field theories in four dimension with an equal to supersymmetry that arise at the same singularity, but in, in type 2B. So uh, here I put some of the similar reference. Of course, uh, this work, uh, um, I mean, this kind of uh, engineering was started uh, in a various paper by Witten, uh, Morrison and Seiberg uh, in, in 4D by uh, Katz, Klem, Waffa and Schaffer and Waffa and, and then many others. And of course, in recent years, uh, in fact, the geometry engineering picture has, uh, has kind of undergone a resurgence. There's been many papers, uh, many interesting work. Uh, here, I'm trying to cite some of the most relevant here. Uh, there will be, I mean, but uh, I apologize if your work is not there. If it's not in our paper, though, which has many more citations, please email us. Um, so the general question for today is if, if I fix a given uh, singularity, which will be a threefold canonical singularity, well, let's first uh, try to remember what do we know? Um, and we will ask, what do we know about both the 5D SCFTs and the 4D SCFT in M theory and type 2B? And then how are they related? So that's the general question. So I will start with a view from M theory, so focusing on the 5D physics, uh, then the view from type 2B, focusing on the 4D physics, and then uh, looking at how they can be related by uh, going to their 3D reduction. And then I will discuss various examples of these pictures. And well, it leads to a bunch of uh, interesting curiosities, I think, um, which uh, we discuss, uh, well, we will discuss, I think, in, in uh, work to in progress and to appear. But I will try to highlight uh, the most interesting ones uh, at this point. So in 5D, uh, so we have 5D in M theory, but let me uh, rewind a bit and just to, so we are on the same page, start with a little bit of history. Um, about the, this, this concept of geometric engineering, which uh, I guess started in that uh, beautiful paper by Katz, Klem, and Waffa in 96, uh, uh, where the idea was to engineer uh, for the unequal two gauge theories directly uh, from geometry. So this is by contrast uh, with uh, brain engineering when you, you have gauge theories because you have an open string sector. Here instead, uh, what we have is a, a local uh, trifold, a, a local Calabria trifold, which looks like a, a local K3, so a resolved uh, AD singularity, fiber over a curve. And uh, the, the shape of the AD fibers will give you an AD or E type gauge group, where uh, you have um, here like light W bosons that correspond to D3, D2 brains wrapped on those uh, fibers. And you take the fiber size very, very small and take the limit of the singularity, then you expect to recover a full uh, non abelian group. And in this uh, geometric engineering picture, you, you need to so you have D2 brains on the fiber, you also could wrap D2 brains on the, on the base curve, so you want to decouple the two. Um, that's the so-called 4 limit or geometric engineering limit. And in this picture, then the gauge in sentence um, are the Walsh sentence that wrap the fibers. And then in principle, by summing this sentence, you can reproduce the inequal to prepotential. And in fact, this can be done uh, for you by geometry using mirror symmetry uh, in type 2B 
where uh, so for this kind of, uh, of of setup here, there is a local mirror which takes this form where it's like an, a local um, tree fall which is described as an, as, a, as, a, as an hypersurface in C4, uh, like u squared plus v squared plus px of y. And px of y equals zero actually is the celebrated celebrated curve that if you want to solve the low energy physics for you. Um, then uh, in this picture, you have, of course, BPS particles on the Coulomb branch, which are d true brains wrapped on three cycles. And uh, yeah, so in type 2b, it's really a classical uh, picture um, that gives you the low energy physics. Now, uh, as, as we could do directly on a silver return curve, we can take further limits. So for SUN uh, engineering, for instance, in, in SUN silver return curve, we could tune some of the, the, the couplings, the parameters. Uh, and uh, well, the Coulomb branch parameters to, uh, to go at uh, Argyros de Glass fixed point. So, an intrinsically superconformal field theory. Uh, and when you do that at this level of the geometry, you, you get this very simple uh, three fold, which is, uh, takes this form here. So, this kind of singularity then, um, so this in general is a, is a smooth three fold, but this guy is literally a canonical singularity in type 2b, and it directly engineers a superconformal field theory for you. So going back to uh, type 2a, well, the geometric engineering, we said we had a 4D gate theory and we took the, the 4D limit or the geometric engineering limit, but it was realized already uh, back in the days that this is of course not necessary to a QFT interpretation because we already on a compact Calabio, so you already decouple gravity, uh, but the, the, the QFT interpretation of the low energy uh, theory uh, of type 2a on this, uh, on this local threefold is not four dimensional, but five dimensional. The interpretation is that you have a, four a five dimensional superconformal field theories that is compactified in a fine size circle. When the fine size circle is like essentially the string coupling because it will be the M theory circle. So what happens is that you really have, a, you should really think about the 5D SCFT, which I would call TX 5D, uh, which is defined if you wish as uh, the low energy uh, limit of M theory on a, on a canonical singularity X, a threefold. And then if you put that M theory on a circle and so on, you go back to a type 2A and you have the theory on a circle. Uh, now directly in M theory, we have uh, again the same picture as, as here. You have a threefold like this, but uh, really we don't need to take a limit between the size of, uh, of the base curve or the fiber. So they're all on the same footing. I have M2 brains wrapping all of them. And when I take the limit, when everything collapses to a singularity, uh, I have an interesting fixed point. But then I can still uh, take some similar limits uh, when I, I would now have a, a 5D gauge interpretation. Um, when I have M2 brains that is the, the, the W bosons and uh, the M2 brains on the base curve give the so-called instantan particles that can exist in, in 5D. Now in 5D, all the, the low energy dynamics on the Coulomb branch is again classically computed. No, no, it's actually classically computed in by, by the M-theory geometry. Um, in, um, yeah, so it's just a triple intersection number of some divisors in, uh, in this threefold after you resolve it. So some general feature of 5D SCFT, um, beyond the fact that they exist, we don't know that much about them, but there, is, there are some general results. So uh, from the geometry, first of all, we, we can see that, well, yeah, we can see that there, there are some operators, which are slightly mysterious, but uh, there are real operators that can get VEV and there is a real Coulomb branch. So unlike in 4D where it's a complex Coulomb branch. Um, the, those SCFTs have no marginal parameters, but they can have deformations. Uh, here I should cite some important work recently by, uh, by uh, Cordova, Dimitrescu, and uh, Intrelegator. I'm sorry, there might be some oversight in the, the citation in, the, in these slides. Um, so the, there will be some operator that uh, with a coupling of mass dimension, and then it will flow to some higher physics. And in some interesting cases, uh, we know that it flows to something that can be described as, an, as, a, as a 5D gauge theory. So 5D gauge theories are, are uh, just effective uh, low energy effective descriptions since the gauge coupling is, the inverse gauge coupling is a dimension of mass, so it's non randomizable, but nonetheless, we, yeah. So the, 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 the IR is, is IR3 gauge theory description. Um, moreover, this SCFT will have a X branch which in general, well, we don't know much about it, but we know for first principle that will be some hypercalar cone by superconformal invariance of some uh, quaternic dimension dh. And here I'm talking about the quantum X branch. So it's really the X branch that emanates from the, the fixed point. So you could also do this deformation, go to the gauge theory, then look at the X branch of the gauge theory, but that will be typically not related to the, the, the quantum X branch. So the, 
to the marine is a bit here from the, how do we see uh, both this, uh, the Coulomb branch and the X branch from the geometry? The Coulomb branch arises in M theory as, a, as a, the space of all crepent resolution. In fact, we have the extended Coulomb branch when we also can turn mass for background vector multiplets for the flavor symmetry. Um, so when you do a crepent resolution, so you will replace the, the singularity by a bunch of, of uh, surfaces, the ex ex exceptional devices, and there will be R of them. And R then is, uh, by definition, from the geometry, the rank of the SCFT, the dimension of the real Coulomb branch. There will also be a bunch of curves, uh, which are dual to non-compact devices, uh, the, what I call F here. Uh, this will be uh, the, essentially the rank of the flavor group. And so the extended Keller cone, which is again classical geometry, gives you everything you need to know about the Coulomb branch. On the other hand, the X branch should correspond to the formation um, of, the, of the variety. So you can deform the, the canonical singularity to a smooth uh, threefold, which uh, will have three cycles, many of them in principle, I mean in general. So the deformation theory, uh, it's not known for generic, completely generic case, but we know it very well, at least in two cases, for toric deformation and for uh, the hypersurface case, which I will focus on. But now in, in the deform case, now you have three cycles, so you can wrap Euclid and M2 branch on it, and that will correct. So the, the, the dimension of the X branch is, is, can be determined uh, by just counting deformation, essentially, but the actual uh, structure of, the, of the, the cone, algebraically, and even more the metric on the Coulomb branch, uh, will depend on all these M2 and incident correction that in that that is that remains a very hard problem. Um, okay, so now I will focus from now on on isolated uh, singularities which are hypersurface. So I just have a, a single equation in C4 uh, with a, a singularity at the origin. And there are two conditions here one from superconforming invariance that we want uh, the polynomial that defines this singularity to be <laughs> quasi homogeneous. So I will have some scalings, uh, QI for my, my four coordinates. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so there is a scaling invariance uh, of this equation and uh, there is a condition that uh, essentially the singularity is Calabio or can arise at the limit of, of, a, of a Calabio. That is the, the canonical singularity condition. And in fact, uh, such a quasi homogeneous uh, polynomial, so with this condition, so these isolated singularities have been completely classified uh, by a nice paper, mathematical paper by Stephen Wu and, uh, and you, um, like, 17 years ago, and it's been used quite a lot in physics by several people, including Shai and Yao. Um, and so we have a full classification here. I'll just give a bunch of examples. Of course, the, the simplest example, but maybe to keep in mind, is just the conifold. Uh, it also engineered a, a 5D CFT, but a trivial one, which is the, the free hypermilit. But if you engineer, for instance, this particular, uh, if you take this particular hypersurface, instead you get a rank one 5D CFT, which has an E6 symmetry, which was discovered by uh, one of the, 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 the first SCFT discovered by Cyberg. Okay, so now for hypersurface singularities, the whole deformation theory is completely well understood. Uh, there is a lot of information this night, I realized, but actually I don't need uh, that much of it. Let me just say that what we, all we're doing really is we have a F equals zero, which is singular. We just add a bunch of other terms uh, that will make the, the equation uh, smooth. So you have a smooth hypersurface. And all the monomial that we can add here uh, are just elements of the so-called Milner ring, defined as follows, which is the, the ring of polynomial uh, divided by the ideal, which are all the derivatives of, of F. Um, now, any, this element in the, in the Milner ring are, are graded by the, the scaling charge, the Q charge. Uh, you can order them, and that's the so-called spectrum of the singularity. It encodes a lot of information about the singularity. I will mention some of it like this later. But in particular, uh, there is a natural monodromy operator that acts on the, on the third cohomology of this singularity. So this, I should mention that this deformed singularity are just have a homotopy type. It's a famous result by Milner. It's, they have a homotopy type of a, of a bouquet of three spheres. So they have only compact three cycles and no other compact cycles for purpose. So from this spectrum, we know a lot of it, including the so-called uh, monochromy operators. Um, all we need to, to know here is that uh, there is then a natural uh, stratification of those monomials with respect to their, uh, their, their scaling dimension, essentially. And uh, for the one that has scaling dimensions smaller or larger than one, they will define uh, an element which is called a mixed arch structure of type one, two, and two, one. So those are like similar to the ordinary complex structure deformation that we know in compact Calabios. Uh, on the other end, for the one uh, which is exactly spectral number uh, L equal one, uh, the, the scaling weight L equal one here, the scaling weight is defined here. Detail don't matter too much, but there is this L equal one, then um, 
those correspond to three cycles, which, so those one are three cycle uh, one, two, and two, and are three cycles that are paired to each other, uh, they are dual to each other. While uh, those uh, three cycles that sit in this, uh, this uh, mixed mix, uh, structure will, uh, will be unpaired. Okay, so there will be uh, F of them, of the unpaired cycles, and uh, the number of, of paired three cycles I will denote by R hat. Um, I, I used the, the, the letter at F, F uh, a moment ago to, de to define the number of uh, the divisor class number here in the resolution. Here we are looking at the deformation, but the two are related. Um, you can think of it as that uh, for any of these unpaired three cycles, you could uh, take a limit when you shrink it to zero, go to through the full singularity, and then go on the other side when you have an unpaired two cycle. So it's like a conifold transition. Now the quaternionic dimension of the X branch is just the number of you little well naively you think in, in eleven dimensions per gravity you have hypermultiplets from three cycles so you just count the three cycles uh, more precisely some of them uh, depending on their scaling dimension will correspond to dynamical or non-dynamical fields so 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 to uh, dimension on the X branch or actually uh, irrelevant couplings so the one that do correspond to the X branch are precisely uh, the one from H one two and H two two so the R hat plus F. So from the spectrum of singularity, then we compute the dimension of the 5D X branch. And this is, uh, I mean, the, the analysis of which is dynamical or not goes on to the work of Gova Pine Witten uh, 20 years ago. So from this, we just know the X branch dimension from this uh, SCFT engineer at this singularity. Uh, we don't know the, the algebraic structure or the metric. And so what uh, one of the motivation here is to, uh, to know a little bit more about this X branch in particular, is it non-trivial uh, or is it just some for instance, the conifold, after all the incident correction, it should be just um, a flat X branch because it's a free tier. Okay. Uh, on the other end, we can also compute, given the singularity, we can compute discrepant resolution, which will go on the on the Coulomb branch, and we can again do that very systematically. Uh, it's been also, it's something that uh, goes back to, of, of course, the, the word of, of Red, and uh, one of uh, Red's former student, Guy Barr, actually did uh, a, comp a very nice analysis in his PhD thesis 20 years ago about this kind of resolution and uh, what, are, what are in particular their topology. So when you resolve, you will have, as we said, R four cycles, R plus F two cycles, but in general, you might also have uh, three cycles in the resolution. That will come from the fact that uh, the exceptional divisors will generally be a whole surface. And from each, uh, when you have a higher uh, a genus larger than zero uh, curve in the base of, the, of, the, of some exceptional divisor, you will actually get uh, for each such uh, sigma g, you will get two g, uh, three cycle in the in the full resolution. Uh, moreover, the, even if you you try to do a maximal crepant resolution, in, uh, at the end of the process, you might still be left over with some terminal singularity, some residual terminal singularities that you cannot resolve further. So the physics interpretation of this is that you go on the on the Coulomb branch, uh, but you can you could also have three cycles, so those give additional free hypers on the Coulomb branch. And then if you have still terminal singularities, you actually should have some IR SCFT left over on the 5D Coulomb branch. And that's what I will discuss uh, at the very end of the talk. So what's the view from type 2B with the same hypersurface singularity? So the, the local Calabio 3, um, as we mentioned in the case in, at the very beginning, provides for us a very nice example of cellular written curves. So in general, uh, it's, it's not a, it does not look like a, like a curve, it, it just like there are three cycles uh, and so on. So, you, but uh, but it's still a several written geometry. Um, and okay, so let me not explain too much of this uh, except that uh, yeah. So idea, so this is like the several written geometry. There is a U plane here. I mean, in general, there are uh, more complicated X branch, but here is like the U plane for the higher dimensional uh, Coulomb branch uh, scaling dimension, the highest scaling dimension. At the origin of this U plane, there will be the, the SCFT, and that's like the singular, uh, well, sorry, at the origin, yeah. At the origin, yeah, there is the SCFT, which is like the singular um, Calabio threefold. And then when you deform, you get a smooth Calabio threefold, and you can compute everything you need to know, like about the SL2, SL2, and uh, SL2 R at Z bundle over it, so the several written geometry. Uh, so, of course, we have many examples of that. As I, we could take any quasi homogeneous singularities, but some of them have been particularly well studied. Of course, if I just take the case where I have x, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus a, a 2 
uh, this FG, where FG is of type A, D, or E, like this, then I would just engineer uh, an ordinary Algeras de glass theory um, of type uh, A, D, or E. And there is some nice generation of that from uh, Chekotin, Hedgeke, and Vafa when you have this threefold, which looks like it's of so called type GG prime. But of, of course, we can do any other. Uh, that's been studied uh, in some paper, uh, including by Chekoti, uh, Del Zotto, Chekoti, Shia, and Yao, and, and many others. Uh, you can take any singularity you like and just compute the spectrum and try to study everything you can. In fact, from this picture here, you really know everything you, you need to know about the, the low energy of direction. Okay, so um, no, let's do the same as we did in 5D, look at the, both the deformation and the resolution and what they correspond to in, in terms of the physics. So first of all, the, the Coulomb range, as we said, is the space of deformation of the singularity in type 2B. And uh, we have the same uh, mixed arch structure element that now will be interpreted as, uh, so we have this uh, scaling weights uh, that up to this redefinition, this uh, can be written as delta L, and those will be literally the scaling dimension of the Coulomb branch operators. So you can compute the Coulomb branch uh, spectrum directly from the singularity. By uh, uh, some important work by Shaper and Tachikawa, similarly, you can actually, from the spectrum itself, you can extract the conformal anomaly A and C. And all of this is done in type 2B as a classical geometry computation. Um, on the X branch side, we need to consider not the crepent resolution of this. And that will give you the, the sorry, that should, that's a typo. It should be the 4D X branch here. Uh, so that will be the, the, the 4D X branch is the space of all crepent resolution. You will have one hypermultiplet for each two cycle in the resolution. So that gives you, by counting the two, the two cycle, we said it was R plus F. Um, so that will be dh hat, that's the, the quaternic dimension of the four dimensional X branch. On a, in addition, we said that on, when you do resolve in general, you might have three cycles uh, in the exceptional, that, that comes from the exceptional locus. Uh, those non -compact, those compact three cycles in the resolve, the singularity will give rise to three vectors now in type 2B. Uh, so that's more familiar in, uh, in, uh, in for the unequal two theories uh, on, the, on the X branch, you might have additional degrees of freedom. Uh, here you could have yeah, three vectors. And in addition, if I have still residual singularities after I resolve, I still have some residual singularities. Those should be interpreted as uh, IR uh, SCFT. So additional, um, additional for the SCFT, which themselves they have no uh, X branch, but sit there at every point on the X branch of the larger theory. Um, so that matches, in fact, the non-structure of the X branch for many other resolver theories. And well, you, we, with this technique, you can compute that for any for any of these hypersurface singularities. Uh, this kind of general structure of the X branch has been explored, for instance, recently in some nice paper by uh, Beam and Menegeli and Rastelli, and, and yeah, uh, where they look at this uh, kind of general structure of the X branch from the VOA perspective. Now, as we said, this at least from this just classical analysis, we determine this basic feature of the X branch, but uh, the, the more uh, detailed uh, information, including the X branch metric, is again beyond reach because now. Uh, I have two and four cycles, so I can wrap D1 and D3 brain instantons on them, and that will correct the, the, the metric and so on. But yeah, nonetheless, uh, this classical analysis of the resolution gives us some nice general information. Um, the one uh, nice uh, thing to comment, and it's like, like a nice uh, constant check on this whole uh, picture, is that we have anomaly matching on the X branch. So on the X branch, uh, the U1R uh, super conformal arch, arch symmetry is, um, is unbroken. So the X branch, you break SU2R, but not U1R in, in 4D. Uh, so the U1R symmetry is, can be computed in the CFT as this 24C minus A of the conformal anomaly, which we said can be computed from the spectrum here. And on the other side, on the X branch, we should just map to the low energy degrees of freedom on the X branch. So we have DH hyper multiplet, which contribute this to 24C minus A, uh, or to the, to the trace of, of U1 anomaly. Uh, and similarly, uh, minus the, there will be one half B3 vector multiplet that contribute this factor. And the last factor is from the residual singularity, since I, I could still have residual IR and CFT on the X branch. So the, the UV computation on the left and the IR computation have to match. And, and that's a nice check of the geometric picture because from the geometry, you compute other different objects and they have to match. I mean, uh, uh, the, it, I don't know if that is, like if there is a general geometric proof uh, of that. I haven't seen that. Um, okay, so 
a last uh, piece of information that we can extract uh, quite easily from this uh, geometry, let's say for the for this for the SCFT in type 2b, are its higher form symmetries. And uh, in this case, the only thing you can have for this class of hypersurface are one form symmetries uh, that uh, you can see as uh, going again on the on the on the Coulomb branch of the theory uh, by looking at line defects on this that can be charged under a putative one symmetry group. Um, and uh, and this one form symmetry will be spontaneously broken. So how it, how it happens essentially that you can have detruit brains that now are wrapping some of the non-compact recycle, relative recycle that can end on torsion cycle on the boundary. So in general, the boundary of the this uh, singularity or the boundary of the, the deformed singularity will be the so-called the link of the singularity. It's a nice five manifold whose topology is very well understood. Uh, so in particular, it can have torsion in this second homology, uh, which always takes the form of F plus F. So it has, uh, yeah. So that will be the so-called uh, defect group that has been called defect group in various contexts in recent literature. We heard some of that in, uh, in, uh, in the talk of uh, Dupay on, on Wednesday. And uh, then by taking uh, some, uh, by taking some uh, Lagrangian sublattice of this, you can look at all the possible um, global structure of the, of the 4D SCFT. So you will choose a sublattice F and send a single one that corresponds to, yeah, well, you can choose any sublattice you want and that will be a, a, what we'll call one electric or magnetic one form symmetries and so on in, in those theories. So the, here is just an example for the G prime theory. Uh, well, you, you can just compute uh, distortion group and then that's the, the result for uh, F here. Uh, we'll give a concrete example in a second. Okay, so, Finally, um, I would like to connect those two. So we, again, we took the same singularity and we, we, we reminded ourselves or we, we developed a bit of what can be known, the general picture of the X branch and Coulomb branch in 5D in M theory or in, uh, in 4D in type 2B. So the, they are connected uh, schematically like this. It's pretty simple. Uh, let me go through that. So the basic picture is that, of course, the system in M theory and in type 2B are completely different SCFTs and different dimension and so on. But, uh, but we know how to, to relate those things. So in M theory, we just first reduce on a circle, we get this KK theory, uh, as we said, in, in type 2A. Uh, but you can reduce it further at type 2A on a further circle, and you would get, um, well, whatever you get. So uh, we call that again a KK theory with three. The only thing that we know in general is that we have three D n equal four supersymmetry, because that's what we started with, eight supercharges. So that will be a KK theory. Um, that on the finite size circle in type 2A. Yeah. Uh, now, be, below the KK scales, uh, I can just think of it as a, as a 3D uh, super, super, super symmetric QFT, um, maybe with a cutoff, uh, that I will call this electric quiver 5, EQ5. Uh, but in uh, some nice circumstances, this, you can then uh, remove the cutoff by just describing this EQ5 as some, for instance, gauge theory that will be then. Uh, what is typically called quiver theories in, in 3D. Similarly, in type 2B, we reduce on a circle. Um, on a finite circle, we flow to the IR. Anyway, below, below the KK scale, then we have uh, this description as uh, this electric quiver of the 4D theory, what I call EQ4. Uh, for not to confuse with the fact that they might not be actually quiver gauge theory, in the paper, we call them electric quiver um, So either in 5D or in 4D. Now, what we also know is that once you come back to find a circle of, of radius beta or uh, one over beta, they're related by t-duality. So the two pictures should really be related by t-duality. In fact, uh, it's known from uh, the work of, uh, of Ori, Ori Oguri and Vafa that um, this kind of t-duality in, in this essentially this setup realizes perturbatively in string theory, the, the famous 3D uh, mirror symmetry of interrogator and cyber for 3D and equal four theories. So uh, the relation, uh, that, that's the relation up to an, an important subtlety. So the subtlety is as follows. Let me first define the magnetic quiver of the 5D theory as the 3D mirror of the electric quiver 5. Similarly, the magnetic quiver of the 4D theory is the 3D mirror of the electric quiver 4. And uh, by this picture, you would think that the electric quiver of, uh, of, of one is the, well, the, the both electric quiver 4 and 5 are related by, by mirror symmetry. It's almost the case, uh, the, the, the subtlety has to do with those, uh, those uh, unpaired three cycle or two cycles. Um, so that, that correspond to flavor symmetries of these theories. 
So the, the proposed relation is that the magnetic quiver of the 5D theory is obtained by taking the extra quiver of the 4D theory here in type 2B, and then gauging uh, the U1F uh, symmetry that, that, that came along, along the flow. Um, and similarly, for the magnetic quiver of the 4D theory, you take the extra quiver of the 5D theory, and uh, so those are all 3D theory, right? But the extra quiver 5 and gauge the U1F. Uh, this gauging is uh, of an abelian symmetry is, uh, is uh, this uh, so-called S-type gauging uh, that was, uh, um, that was uh, discovered by Kapusin and Strassler and, and further uh, studied by Witten. Um, and it's a very simple and nice process in 3D. In particular, it is reversible. So you add, uh, you gauge an abelian symmetry. Uh, you add, uh, so you, you add the tier, and, but you also add, uh, when you do that, you also add a topological symmetry and you can keep track of that. Then you could also gauge the topological symmetry in the new theory, and you go back essentially to where you started. So this is a re reversible process. Okay. Um, so that's uh, then summar to, sum to summarize. Um, of course, in 3D and equal four, the Coulomb branch and X branch are now both hyperkähler cones. So the X branch was always hyperkähler cones, and uh, uh, the picture we have is that uh, we don't expect the X branch to change when you dimensionally reduce. So it's the same. Uh, the X branch of the 5D theory is the same as the X branch of the electric quiver, uh, the electric quiver uh, five. In particular, it has this dimension dh. Uh, but the Coulomb branch was real in 5D, but it becomes again quaternionic. Uh, I mean, hyperkähler. I mean, in uh, in three dimension. And of course, mirror symmetry exchanges the two. That's the general picture of just their their dimension. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, what was, if you want, the, the motivation is to use this, this beautiful context of the magnetic quiver that was advocated in particular by, well, starting in the work really in the 90s of Anani and Witten and a lot of recent work by Anani and, and, and collaborators, uh, when uh, in their case, they look at uh, PQ webs systems of various uh, SCFTs in 4D and 5D and do various operation to extract um, from this a 3D and equal, uh, a 3D and equal four uh, gauge theory, whose Coulomb branch is precisely the X branch of the, the quantum X branch of the theory you wanted to start with. So those are uh, typically uh, brain web operation and so on. Here uh, we propose a way of getting the magnetic quiver as a matter of principle, at least uh, from uh, this geometric engineering picture. So to sum in, in summary, uh, in particular, if I want to know the X branch of the 5D SCFT, I need to compute the magnetic quiver of this 5D and compute this X branch, and similarly for the 4D SCFT. Okay, and the uh, one advantage of this picture is that, unlike I told you that the X branch in uh, in uh, 5D and 4D in M theory and type 2B was pretty hard to uh, to get uh, handled out because of this uh, M brain or uh, M2 brain or D brain instanton. Uh, similarly, in, now in this picture, we we still have some uh, some uh, instanton corrections in those 3D. Uh, but uh, when you just think about in terms of, of 3D gate theory or well, 3D theories, yeah, the gate theories, uh, you have a better handle in it because this problem of summing the instant uh, comes about to summing monopole operators in 3D, which are much better understood. So after all of this, uh, I, I, I think I have six minutes, perfect to, uh, to discuss examples. So the first example will be this singularity here. So x to the two, x two to the three, x three to the six, x four to the six n, where n is some, some integer, um, one or larger. So this for n equal one in particular is just the, the famous E8 theory of, of Cyborg and in general it's rank n generalization. Uh, we can compute all the things we said, the resolution, the, the, the crepent resolution and the deformation and so on and compute all the various data, r and f uh, and r at uh, of these singularities. In particular, if you look at the Crepent resolution, you will have R exceptional devices. Uh, one of them will be GP8, and the N minus one others will be a uh, ruled surface over a genus one curves. So in particular, there will be two N minus two, uh, three cycles in this, uh, in this particular resolution. Uh, by mapping, the, by checking the intersection numbers between all these, uh, these devices, you can match to the, the five gauge theory, something in that case that was done uh, by integrator Morris and Cyberg in, uh, in 97. And in that case, the description of this particular resolution is in terms of uh, the low energy description in terms of a 5D gauge theory, which has SP and gauge group with seven flavor, fundamental flavor and N1 anti-symmetric. Okay, on the deformation side, um, we compute again the spectrum, let's say in terms of those 4D uh, delta, 
uh, which uh, the deltas here, the, the scaling dimension on the 4DX, Coulomb branch are all integers. And uh, well, in that case, it's again a well-known case, uh, but you can see that it's only, the only way to match it to uh, the spectrum of Coulomb branch, you can match it to Lagrangian SCFT, which is just a bunch of SUN uh, gauge groups, pictured by this quiver, which are connected together by, by fundamentals. And all the beta function vanish, so it's a nice uh, Lagrangian SCFT. Uh, so in our case, and it, it's a Lagrangian theory, so actually reducing here on our picture directly to, uh, to 3D uh, can be done directly. I mean, uh, it just, the, you, what you should have is that the 3D theory can be described by the same SUN type uh, gauge theory as a 3D equal 4 theory. Um, now, these are SUN gauge group, and there is a U1 to the 8, so F was 8 here. Um, the... Yeah, the U1 to the 8 flavor symmetry, which is the flavor symmetry that rotates the, uh, the I pairs here can be gauge. And then all this is the same quiver that you get, but it's in terms of U1 gauge group. And this will be our magnetic quiver of the 5D theory. OK, so that connects to known results. Now, uh, for something new, um, you take the following singularity, which is uh, in type 2B, it's well known. It engineers uh, Aguirre's glass theory or, uh, or chekhov nice Vafa uh, type theory of type A to D4. Uh, I show here the information. In particular, there is a nice spectrum of uh, th this simple spectrum of four uh, Coulomb branch operators. Um, in that case, you can think of this, uh, you can describe this uh, Argyros gas theory as a conformal gauging of an SU2 with uh, three type, uh, a three type Argyros gas theories. And there is a choice of global structure that has to do with the, the one form symmetry that I mentioned before. In that case, you can think of it as being the, the usual form. Uh, global structure of, a, of an issue 2 gauge group in, in three dimension, except that we have this kind of non-Lagrangian matter. And I mean, that's a prediction from geometry that this Lagrangian matter A3 here coupled to this SU2 in a conformal way, uh, this A3 has a SU2 uh, global symmetry. You can couple it to this SU2 gauge theory. Uh, and the prediction then from the geometry is that since we see a one form symmetry, uh, the, this, this kind of matter should not break the center. Okay, so that's in type 2B, nothing mysterious there, uh, just in interesting model. But uh, in, in, uh, if you look at the same model in, uh, in M theory, it's a bit more mysterious. Um, so first of all, it is known that, the, again, we need to not take, uh, take, so in that case, F equals zero. So I can just consider that now as the magnetic quiver of the 5D theory. Well, first I need to reduce to 3D and then that will be the magnetic quiver. So that, uh, let me reduce that to 3D. Well, we can use the fact that the A3 theory it's known that it, it flows to 3D. I mean, it can be described, in, it flows to a fixed point in 3D. That is the, the, the fixed point of 3D SQED with two flavor. So U1 with two flavor. So this, I replace my A3 here with uh, essentially U1 with two flavor that's the SU2. So that's the, the, the gauge theory description of my A3 quiver, which is the same as my magnetic quiver of the 5D theory. And then the structure of this X branch can be uh, obtained by uh, using uh, I mean, as a diagnostic of to, to see at least how it looks like, you can compute this Hilbert series, which is like the simplest partial function for these theories that you can compute. Uh, and there is a nice formula. Uh, just to let you know, you just got one minute left. Okay, thanks. So there is a, yeah, using the Merkel formula, you can see that the X branch is non trivial. In one case, it is uh, like three hypers. In the other case, it is like a, a caution of three hyper. So that leads us to a tentative conjecture that and, and other example that if you look at this, uh, these singularities and look at them in, in M theory, that will correspond to free hypers or discrete gauging from them. I mean, it looks very non-trivial from M theory, but that's what our, our picture suggests. Uh, very quickly, uh, similarly, you can consider more general singularities like this one. This one is one example when there is still a terminal singularity. And terminal singularity is precisely the, the, the singularity we discuss here. So, in, uh, this is an example, again, nothing mysterious in, in, uh, in 4D, in type 2B, but in M theory, it looks like a, a new rank one theory um, that is not in the, in the list or in the classification that have been proposed so far. So that lets me to conclude. So we revisited the geometric engineering of 4D and 5D SCFTs in, uh, at hypersurface singularities. And uh, the, the most of the mathematics, I mean, all of the mathematics is really classical. There'd be some nice results uh, 20 years ago, but most of the math uh, about those things is known since the late 70s. Nonetheless, uh, we see that uh, by doing all this resolution uh, and deformation very explicitly, you could uh, uncover some new physics. Um, the analysis captures essential feature of both the Coulomb branch and the X branch, as we saw. 
And to explore the X-branch physics, we then reduce to 3D and related uh, the, the two theories by a mirror symmetry. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, we had the paper today, but uh, it, it's, it's also, there will be more to appear and more work in progress. I think there is many more to be uncovered. Um, so stay tuned. Um, I would like to conclude with like maybe two questions. Um, first is, can we really understand those? So I just told you that there are various, uh, well, very fast. I told you that there are new rank zero 5D CFTs. Um, many of them, or maybe all of them seems to be just discrete gauging of free hypermultiplet in 5D, although that's, that's not uh, approved yet. It looks like free hypers in 3D, but it could be non-trivial in 5D, more non-trivial. Uh, in any case, it will be very interesting to understand that better in QFT language, because uh, once you start uh, putting those rank zero building blocks uh, together in rank one theory and so on, it seems to give many more possibilities uh, as, to, uh, as to 5D physics. And uh, as a aside, I would like to, to mention something maybe more for the experts, that in all this construction, I was really, I mean, under, under the hood, we were thinking about either super gravity approximation or plus instant corrections, but uh, really those, a lot of those singularities actually do not admit redshift flat conical metric. That's true, for instance, for the, the one that gives Argyra theory in type 2b. Um, so it's known that there is no like Sasegian chain metric on the link. And I don't know what that means for string theory, uh, but that's an open question. So thank you. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Cyril. Uh, I'm going to unmute everyone and invite them to be around the calls. And that's the last talk. Uh, and I'll now open up the floor to questions if anyone has any questions. You can use the raise hand feature if you like, or you can just unmute yourself if you prefer. Okay, Shlomo Mazamat has a question, so I'm just going to unmute you. Please go ahead. Hi, Cyril. Thank you for the talk. Uh, on one of your last slides, when you showed the last of your example, I, I think, mm -hmm. uh, one the slide before. Yes, mm -hmm. no, the next one, sorry. Yeah. So is it uh, the mirror dual of the T2 theory? Yes, I believe so. Um, yeah. So is there a meaning? So it's in, in your picture for that? So in that in that case, I think there is uh, the theory on the left is just a discrete gauging of a free theory, right? Yeah. So do you have a That's what the adversary is going to say. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's a bit subtle, but it seems to be in the, the singularity is like can be, what was it? Yeah, the singularity can be deformed to like the theory description of, of the 5D T2 theory, for instance, mm -hmm. by adding some marginal terms. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there's a question from Michelle Del Zotto. So I'm just going to unmute you. you go ahead. Hi, Cyril. Um, thanks uh, for the very nice talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions, if I if I may. Uh, no. So the, the first one is: Can you can you go one slide uh, after this? Can, can, the the yes. Can you can you speak about this? Hmm. Well, yes. Um, so oh, yeah, I should have shown the resolution. But uh, so yeah, you can. Well, what do you want to know about it? I mean, I can speak more about it. Well, I guess, why but... is it new? Uh, what is yes. uh... so well so if you compute the so if you compute this information here you see that uh, there is uh, no flavor rank um, apparent at least the it's a rank one theory because it has a single resolution but uh, not the uh, so the it has the terminal singularity still so you cannot resolve further that uh, if you compute the deformation and so on you see that the, the dimension of the x branch is 16 which is not the number of the the dimension of any uh, rank one theory that is known. So yeah, it looks like, and okay, so on the other end, uh, the, the exceptional divisor looks in that case like, um, like uh, DP6, um, 
but with a singular exceptional devices, like a singular DP6. Um, so it looks very much like uh, the, the E6, uh, rank one E6 theory, but cobbled to something else, which is this kind of residual singularity. And do you have an interpretation for this residual singularity? Is it uh, some sort of generalized matter? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's what the, the residual singularity is the one, it's like the, the T2 here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like T2, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it is T2, but I don't know if T2 in, in five days, well, it's, it's a free hyper or something else. Yes, because the, 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 idea was that, the, mm -hmm. the idea is, was that the, in, in the classification of rank one theories, right, is based uh, on, or at least the, the, the historical one, is essentially based on, on studying gauge theories, yes. uh, coupled to ordinary matter and, and, sure. and check uh, yeah. properties of the, of the metric along the Coulomb branch. Yeah, so the logic is that we instead we're taking the, the canonical singularity seriously and we see all this canonical singularity, like the point, but one of the point I want to make is that the, the same interpretation of this thing, the same singularity in, in type 2b is completely mundane. I have a SCFT mm -hmm. with an X branch with an extra SCFT on top of the X branch is well known. Yes. I mean, example of that. But here in, in M theory, then you have to interpret this residual singularity. And yeah, the, the interpretation would be as a, no, a SCFT huh? everywhere on the, on the Coulomb branch of the 5D SCFT. And then uh, the, the other question was if you can, uh, you, you mentioned this idea of uh, rank zero CFTs in 5D. Mm -hmm. And, and do, can, can you comment about the same question about the four dimensional theories? Yeah, we have some brief comment on that. I mean, you don't have that. Um, you can have same the play the same game for different type of singularities. If you look at Turing singularities, uh, Turing singularities again engineered things like the E1 Seibert theory in 5D uh, very nicely in M theory as a as a singularity. If you consider them in uh, in um, in 2B instead, they look like. Interesting rank zero SCFT. That's something that was mentioned in some paper already by uh, Shea and Yao, I think like five years, three, a few years ago. Uh, although they didn't really study much, and it's really hard to study anything uh, about it. Uh, but yeah, from the same kind of computation, at least using the magnetic quiver, uh, in the case of like, for instance, the E1 uh, toric singularity, it looks like, again, I think in that case, like uh, two hyper multiplets uh, with a, possibly a Z2 gauging. Um, so there is a choice of global structure in that case as well. So in that case, they are like discrete gauges of a, group, of a bunch of hyper -multiples. Well, what we can do is go reduce to 3D, compute the X branch, you know, we compute the X branch by going to mm -hmm. 3D. So in 3D, it looks like uh, the, the fixed point is just three hypers, but it doesn't tell you that much about 4D. I mean, we, we know also that the mirror dual of various series in many cases are three hypers and so on. Mm -hmm. There's been recent work to that effect. Uh, that doesn't mean that the various theory upstairs were, was, was not trivial, it's not. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a lot of essentially because a lot of those uh, those uh, those dimensions on the Coulomb branch in 4D we know flow and so on once you reduce on the circle like so. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. It doesn't look like there are. Any more questions? Ah, oh, no, okay, there's one more question. I'm just gonna unmute you so you can ask your question. Hi, thank you. It's just a technical definition, it's just a technical question about uh, the definition uh, of your uh, mixed hoid structure. Mm -hmm. Are you, is this, um, are you using uh, the linear um, uh, definition or uh, for mixed hoid structures on uh, singular varieties here? And if yes, what is the weight filtration? Yes. Uh, it is, and the weight filtration is just defined by it just uh, given from from this number. So those uh, those uh, number here, or more precisely, the the, the exponential the, the exponential of this number e to the two pi i of this l i are mm -hmm. uh, are the the uh, the eigenvalues of the monodromy operator, the classical monodromy of these singularities. Mm -hmm. And in, in those cases, for this quasi major singularity, it's a diagonalizable monodromy and so on, so you have very simple uh, weight filtration, but yeah, that's, that's what it is. Wait, the monodromy should be quasi unipotent. Yeah, but in, yeah, in that case, it's, it's, uh, it's unipotent. And uh, so it, maybe it, I wrote it. it. Is given. Okay, okay, so you're calculating the mixed hot structure essentially using the, yeah. the peak and left yet theory or knowing the monodromy around. Something. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Cyril? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, if not, uh, nice, thank you again, Cyril. And I guess we'll go and have a break now uh, until the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Hi, Sohila. I've made you co-host. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. And you? Uh, fine. Thank you. Excellent. Hi, Sohila. Nice to meet you. Uh, hi. Nice to see you. So um, I cannot see the part of question and answer. Is it is it it's something that chat. I should? It's in the chat. So if you uh -huh, click okay, everything is in the chat. Okay. You see, you'll see some questions and answers, but otherwise, um, people will raise their hands and ask the questions specifically um, okay. once they've been requested. Okay. Sure. Uh, do you want that I share the screen to check that everything yes. works? Yeah. That would be good. So is it is it good like this, or do you want me to to make it a kind of uh, full screen mode? I think if you go to full screen mode, that would be better. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, so uh, just I have to no, I have to just mute something. That's why I'm I'm going out. Then I, I will just make it again for the screen. Mode. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, I I will change it to full screen mode in a minute. That I have to just uh, unmute some some of these notifications. To sure. Not, no not disturb.
think we can probably start back up now. Um, are you ready, Sahela? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So welcome back, everyone. Um, we're very happy to have Sahela Faizpaksh from Imperial College London, who's going to tell us about curve counting and estuality. Um, hello everyone, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to speak at this conference. Um, I'm going to speak about curve counting and stuality, which is uh, one part of an ongoing project with Richard Thomas at Imperial College. I will first fix my setup and explain what, what are what are the varieties that I'm going to work on them, and then talk about the main result about curve counting and astrology, which is written in the recent paper uh, with Richard Thomas. To prove the result, we have used the notion of uh, weak virtual and stability conditions and wall crossing with respect to them. Um, that's why I quickly recall what is this notion and uh, what is wall crossing with respect to weak stability conditions. And uh, finally, I will talk a bit about the sketch uh, about about idea of how we can apply weak stability conditions uh, to prove the main result. And if time allows, I uh, will talk about modularity uh, from, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, astrology in physics. Okay. So let X01 be a smooth, polarized, complex, projective threefold. Uh, and H be just the C1 of O1, though we do not require H to be effective. I'm going to always assume that the conjectural bogoma of Gisikar inequality of Bayer, Macri, and Toda holds for big semi stable objects in the bounded drive category of coherent sheaves on X. I will explain shortly what is this conjecture in full details. We know that this conjecture is ho holds for many three faults, such as P3 or quintic three faults. Okay, now fix a cohomology class beta in the image of this uh, integral cohomology H4, X0, Xz, and uh, an integer number m. And uh, consider the chain character V10 minus beta minus uh, m on, on the trifold X. Okay. Then I'm considering the, mo uh, the modular space I am X beta, which is just the Hilbert scheme of sub schemes of dimension less than one, such that the topological type of this sub scheme is beta and the Euler characteristic of its structure sheaf is M. That's why the modular space of stable sheaves of character V, which is one zero minus beta minus M is the product of uh, I am X beta and peak zero of X. So a pick zero of X just consists of uh, line bundles with torsion C1. Okay, so here the notion of stability does not really matter because they all con just consist of torsion free sheaves of this class one zero minus beta and minus M. The second moduli space that I'm going to consider is moduli of joy sign pairs, which is just a pair of a torsion free sheaf of class B, which is just lies in the moduli space that I explained above. And S is just a non-zero section of uh, from twisting of OX to this torsion free sheaf. Okay. So now um, if I just uh, look at this non-zero map, since these two sheaves are both torsion free, this map must be injective. That's why we can look at this co-kernel. And for a generic section, this co-kernel is, is just a rank one sheaf on a divisor. That's why it's a stable two-dimensional torsion sheaf and uh, of chain character Vn. The chain character Vn is super special. It's like zero in H minus beta minus N square H square over two and minus M plus N, N cube H cube over six. And the third moduli space that I want to consider is just the moduli of H G seeker semi-stable two-dimensional shapes of character Vn. The main result that I'm going to explain today is that these three moduli space, I am X beta, J S N of V and M X H of Vn all carry the same information. 
So the main theorem that we prove it in joint work with Richard is uh, as follows. So just fix a uh, inter integral cohomology beta in H4, uh, in the image of H4x to H4xq and let M be an integer number and choose N sufficiently large. We can make this N, this bound here to be effective, but it's quite numeric. That's why I omit this numerical part from here. So I choose n large enough and suppose that the conjecture of Bogomol of this Ukraine inequality of Bayer, Macri, and Toda holds on X. Then for any shift of chain character Vn that I've described above, the notion of Giesecker and slope stability and semi-stability all coincide. So if a shift of character Vn is slope stable, then it is a slope semi-stable, then it is also slope strictly slope stable. The second point is that this moduli of joy sign pairs is a projective bundle over the moduli space of torsion free shifts on X. And the key result is that is the following. If I take a pair, you know, if take of a joy sign pair, um, a torsion free shift of character V and a non-zero section S and a line bundle L uh, with torsion C1, then I can look at its co-kernel and tensor it with this line bundle. The first claim is that this map is always well-defined. In other words, the co-kernel of this joy sign pair is always a slope semi-stable. And the main point is that this is actually an isomorphism. So any slope semi-stable sheaf of character Vn can be just written as the, and can be written uniquely as the co-kernel of a joy sign pair tensoring with a line bundle with torsion C1. You know, the surprising point that you probably notice is that this, this implies that any slope semi-stable shift of character Vn, uh, when n is very large, must, be, uh, must, be, must have rank one on its support. So all other shifts that you can imagine of them of character Vn are necessarily on a sale. Okay. So now I want to discuss about the immediate result, uh, immediate glory of this result in curve counting. So let's start with a clavier trifold, but the clavier trifold, I mean just the canonical bundle is trivial and each one of the structure sheet vanishes. Since all the above three modular space that I've described in them, semi-stability and the stability coincide. All of them have symmetric obstruction theory, and the virtual cycle is of dimension zero. That's why we can just consider their degree. The first one is that I denote by I am beta of x just counts idle shift of curves and points of character beta, on m, which is by MNOP conjecture is equivalent to a Gramovitan invariant. The second one counts joy song pair of character beta and M, and finally the third one counts D4, D2, D0 brain, or two-dimensional torsion shifts, a stable torsion shifts of character Bn, which I denoted by omega Bn of x, and it is subject to the famous uh, S-duality conjecture in physics, which hopefully I will, uh, I will have time to explain it at the end. Okay, so the, 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 uh, the, Immediate glory of the theorem that I've explained is, is the following. So if I fix beta and m as above and choose n very large, then omega v n of x is just the product of n n and I, I am beta of x, where n n is just the product of this factor and square of the number of torsion elements in this integral cohomology. Okay. If there is no question, then I want to uh, now look at uh, briefly at the notion of weak stability conditions uh, and explain a little bit about what is the idea behind it. So we start with a, a coherent sheaf on an arbitrary telephone. This X here is just any smooth projective telephone X. Then in the classical notion of a slope stability, uh, we just look at degree over rank. So and define a slope of E to be just degree over rank if the rank is non-zero and it's past infinity if the rank is equal to zero, okay? 
Then we say that H coherent sheaf is mu H stable if the slope of all sub object of uh, sub sheaves of E is lower than the slope of E itself. Then corresponding to mu H stability, there exists a unique Harden Arismond filtration for any sheaf E that I denote by mu H plus of E and mu H minus of E, the maximum and the minimum slope in this Harden Arismond filtration. I denote by dx the bounded drive category of coherent sheaves on x. What I'm going to explain now is precisely the idea of Tom Bridgeland to construct Bridgeland stability conditions on K3 surfaces. But in the case of three folds, we only get weak stability conditions. So we start with a, a real number B and we just replace the category of coherent sheaves that we consider in the Cascon notion of slope stability by tilt with respect to a torsion pair. So, and obtain another abelian subcategory, which is the heart of the bounded structure of our triangulated category. And it consists of two term complexes, such that mu h plus of kernel of D is smaller than or equal to B and mu h minus of co-kernel of D is bigger than B. Okay, then for any real number W bigger than B square over two, we can define the notion of a slope. It's quite similar to the mu H slope of E. It's just again, degree over rank. It's just chain two of E dot H minus W chain three of E over chain one B H of E, where chain B H of E is just defined as the cup product of chain of E with E tracing by minus B H. So if you just look at definition of the heart here, you see that this number here, chain one B H of E, which is just chain one dot H square minus B chain zero of E is always a non-negative non number. That's why it behaves like rank here, okay? And the top sentence here is just like degree. So we can define an object in the drive category is new beyond W semi-stable if and only if a shift of E lies in our heart AB. And for all non-trivial quotients of this shifted uh, shift by K of E, uh, the new BW slope of these quotients are bigger or bigger than equal uh, or equal to uh, slope of uh, um, new B slope of uh, EK. Now, if I fixed an object E in, in the drive category, then um, I can vary the point B and W in this upper half plane. Uh, sorry, in, the, in this open sub, uh, subset above this parabola uh, of W equal to B square over two. So corresponding to every point B and W on this open subset, I have a, a notion of new B and W stability. But the key point here is that uh, this new B, uh, B and W stability is continuously changing. In other words, there are locally finite set of ball on this open subset such that when I'm moving along each of this chamber, new B and W stability of E is not changing. So if E is stable here, it remains a stable along the whole of this chamber. But as soon as I cross each of these four, it's just switch from stability to instability or vice versa. This phenomena is called what crossing. Okay. Uh, then to construct a stability conditions, you know, bridge line stability conditions on three folds, we need a kind of Bogomolov type inequality for new B and W stable objects. And this is precisely the conjecture of Bayer, Macri, and Toda. They said that, uh, you know, they conjecture that for any new B and W semi-stable object in the heart, which satisfy this condition for the chain character, then we can control chain three of this new semi-stable object from the above, okay? So if we prove this conjecture, then, then, you know, then we, then it's quite straightforward to just, just show that there exists a Bridgeland stability conditions on our threefold. That's why this is the key step to prove the uh, existence of Bridgeland stability conditions. But to prove the theorem, in, uh, the theorem that I mentioned, we, we do not need this strong version of uh, bogomov gisikar inequality. We just need a weakening version, which is just bogomov gisikar inequality for two special characters. 
we only need that the BG conjecture holds for objects of character Vn and specific values of V, and also for torsion free shifts of rank one and a specific churn one and churn two in very specific points of V and W. Okay, that's why probably proving of this breaking BMT conjecture is much easier than the general version. And this is precisely what we need to prove uh, the main theory that I mentioned. Okay, this BMT conjecture and in particular its uh, weakening has been proved in lots of examples, including the projective space P3, the quartic threefold, or more generally any funnel threefold of Picard's rank one. And also for any abelian threefold, uh, a caveat threefold of abelian type, a Kummer threefold, or a product of an abelian variety and PN. And also it's proved for threefolds with NEF tangent bundle. And finally, in a uh, quite recent, in a recent part by Trinity, it's just proved for a quintic threefolds. And in a much more recent work with Kosicki, it's just proved for other examples of clavial trifles. Okay, now I want to just explain how we can use the notion of uh, weak stability conditions and wall causing to prove the theorem that I mentioned. So we start with a slope semi stable shift of chain character Vn. When I say it's a slope semi-stable, just I mean that all non-trivial subsheaves of S has a slope, and since it's of rank zero, the slope is just churn two over churn one. For all non-trivial subsheaves, churn two over churn one of a prime is lower than or equal to the churn two over churn one of F itself. Okay. The key claim to prove the theorem is the fall. If I start with any slope semi-stable shift of chain character Vn, then the first claim is that it is slope stable. So it cannot be strictly semi-stable. And there exists a unique pair I, S, and L here. Whereas before, I and S is a Joyce-Song pair, where I is a torsion-free shift of chain character V, and S is a non-zero section and L here is a line bundle with uh, torsion C1. Then the claim is that any slope semi-stable shift of chain character V is isomorphic to, to the co-kernel of a Joyce sign pair tensoring by a line bundle with torsion C1. Okay, this is precisely what I'm going to prove now. So to prove this result, we start in the large worm limit. In the large realm limit, we know that any rank zero shift is a slope semi-stable if and only if it is new B and W semi-stable for any B in R and W large enough. So since our shift is slope semi-stable, it is new B and W semi-stable for W very large. The next step is that we move down this line vehicle to B0 for a very specific choice B0 here, which is minus N over two minus beta H and HQ. Okay, so let me go to the next figure that I explained here. So we start here in the large worm limit when W is very large. And we know that my object, my shift, which is a slope and semi-stable is new B and W semi-stable here. Then I move down this line B equal to B0. When I move down here, of course, the notion of stability is gradually changing. The first claim is that all of the walls for, for my fixed object F are just parallel lines. And these lines all have a slope B0, the same B0 here. That's why this vertical line intersect all walls, all possible walls for F. Okay, that's why this is a very good choice uh, of this uh, line. Okay, now when we move down here, what's going on? Is it, you know, the first thing is that do we really hit a wall or it is possible that my object remain stable up to the end when W gets very low. But the first thing is that if we apply the Bogomolo Gisekar inequality, the part one case, it just shows that there is a point WF here such that 
the, the sheath F cannot be stable below this point, okay? That's why there is a point W0 above, above WF such that my object gets first destabilized. And there is a wall for F which uh, intersect this vertical line. Okay, this is precisely the application of the bogomov gisikar inequality for my shifts of character Vn. But the next step is that we start to uh, examine the destabilizing factors along the wall. One of the key points here is that when I'm moving along this wall L for the shift F, the destabilizing object remain in the heart and remain of the same slope as my, uh, my sheaf F. That's why I can control their, uh, their chain characters and show that the wall for F lies below the wall that twisting of a structure sheaf is making. So the wall L lies below this red line. Let me summarize what I've explained here. So the wall that bounds the large ram limit chamber for F has a slope B0 and passes through the point B0 omega zero, the W0. And we know that this W0 lies between WF and this number, which is precisely the point on this red line. Okay, so that's this W0 lies between this omega F and this number. Then on this wall, there is a destabilizing sequence F1, F, and F2 in the heart AB0. We know that F2 is a two-term complex and, it, and has cohomology in degree zero and degree minus one. And the shift in the cohomology in degree zero has a support uh, in dimension less than one. And F1 is a rank one torsion free shift, okay? And we can control what is precisely churn one of F1 uh, dot H square and bound churn two of F1 dot H. Okay. Now the next step is, um, is, is to understand what, what, what this bound for churn two of F1 dot H is, is means. So the first point is that if this beta h is negative, then, uh, then we reach a contradiction here. That's why if beta h is small than zero, then there isn't such slope semi-stable shift f of character vn. And so this moduli space is empty. On the other hand, we know that this moduli space i m x beta and this moduli joy sign pair is also empty when beta dot h is small than zero. So this just proves the theorem directly in this case. That's why we can uh, assume from now on that beta h is bigger than or equal to zero, okay? Now, um, now I can control churn one of f1 dot h and churn two of the f1. Um, and similarly, since we know that the churn, churn i of f1 plus churn i of f2 is equal to the churn character of f, we can similarly control the churn character of f2. So the remaining part is to control chain three of F1 and F2. And that's exactly the point that we want to apply a bogomov gisiker inequality, the conjectural bogomov gisiker inequality for this object, okay? So we know that both these two shifts are stable here at this point B0 and W0. So we can directly apply the bogomov gisiker inequality at this point. But well, unfortunately, it doesn't give us a very nice bound for chain three of the destabilizing object. That's why the idea is that we move a little bit below this wall. Okay, so the so the, the claim is that since since the chain character of the dispersed destabilizing uh, object F1 is very special, is of rank one and chain one of this uh, F1. You know, I, I put it like general lemma, like E here, that H square is equal to zero. So we can, uh, we can just move along another vertical line, which is the vertical line B prime equal to minus one over H3, okay? The key lemma is that if, my, if I start with any object in, in this part, 
with this fixed rank and this fixed rank one, and it is semi-stable for some w bigger, some w bigger than b prime square over two. In other words, b prime and w is in the open subset u that I've explained. Then it is new b prime w stable for all w bigger than b prime square over two. Okay, so if you look at this figure here. You know, B prime lies here. You know, we know that this B1 is bigger than minus one over two H3. That's why the line B prime looks is lies here. I, I didn't put it because I didn't want to just make the figure quite messy. That's why, uh, so, so we know that the point, F, the, the object F1 is a stable here. That's why we can move along this vertical line B equal to B prime and go to W uh, at at the boundary. So we just consider the limit of this lemma and then apply the bogomov Gisica inequality and find a very nice bound for churn three of F1. But we can apply a similar argument for, for F2 uh, tasting by N. Now, if you just consider this object, then its character is quite similar to the object F1. That's why we can apply the same argument to be able to control churn three of if uh, if two testing by n. Okay. Uh, now, if we look at these two proposition, we can see that if n goes very large, then these two comp composition uh, of these two proposition is possible only if churn two of f one dot h is precisely minus beta h. Okay. That's why we can obtain precisely what is the churn two class or character of the destabilizing object of fun. And then we can apply whole index theorem to find precisely what is churn one of the degree minus one cohomology of F2. Then the next step is to show that H minus one of F2 must be a line bundle and the degree zero cohomology of F2, H zero of F2 must, be, uh, must vanish. That's why F2 is just the shift of a line bundle. And if you look at the character F1 here, as I explained before, this F1 is a torsion free shift. Okay. So the destabilizing sequence looks like this sequence that I wrote here. It's just the first object is a torsion free shift um, of character V. So it lies in a moduli space that I first uh, described. And this line bundle here. Uh, here is a, is a line bundle with torsion C1. Therefore, if we look at uh, the F tensoring bit L jaw, we can see that F is precisely the co-kernel of this uh, joy song pair. Okay, so this proves the first part of uh, the claim that which shows that for any shift f, uh, for any slope semi-stable shift f of chain character v, there exists a Joyce and pair such that this shift is precisely its co -kernel. Now the next step is that we move a little bit below the line l, the, the wall for f. Then it's easy to show that this sequence is the harder Nyssman filtration of f. And then the uniqueness of the harden Nyssman filtration give us directly the, uh, the uniqueness of this joyce sign pair and the uniqueness of this sequence for, for my slope semi-stable shift F. And then it's a kind of usual work crossing argument to show that uh, my shift F must be slope stable and it cannot be strictly semi-stable. Okay. So now I want to, uh, fortunately I have much more time than I imagined at the beginning. So I have, uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the modularity from um, uh, a, a, a duality point of view in physics. So I just come back again to the case of uh, Calabial threefold. And so again, the canonical bond is trivial. And for simplicity, I assume that H1 of OX vanishes and uh, it, uh, this integral cohomology has no torsion. Okay. Then it's expected in physics that uh, omega Vn, which is just the counting of uh, uh, sim, uh, count, counting of stable shifts of character Vn uh, have modular properties. 
But the key questions here is that what is precisely the notion of stability that we need to consider for 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 charge VM? I think it was at the beginning expected to that we need to consider the notion of key secure stability, but but currently, but currently, I think the expectation is that we need to modify the notion of key secure stability to a new notion of large volume attractor point. Okay, so if we just work on what is precisely the center charge for this large volume attractor point, we can see that um, the slope function for this center charge is precisely this slope here. But in, in, in our argument, we always allow n goes to infinity. That's why, that's why this, it seems that this second sentence is not very important when n goes to infinity and this slope just tends to the slope of a front. But you know, the main key point is that when we are changing n, the sub um, objects f prime is also changing. But we prove that when, when n is very large, uh, there are not strictly semi-stable shifts uh, uh, of character Vn, and all of them are uh, stable. That's why probably we can tell a little bit the slope. That's why maybe uh, this uh, large volume attractor point when n is very large coincides with the notion of uh, slope stability that we consider here. Anyway, if we, can, you know, if we consider slope stability or large volume attractor point stability, you know, this notion of the stabilities are, uh, are invariant under uh, uh, on, uh, are preserved by tensoring by, by, by line model. So omega of Vn, uh, this counting of this character is equal to uh, omega of the cup product of um, uh, e to power of L for, for any line model L with uh, Vn, okay? So, but uh, we know that um, these two object, uh, this these two Vn and e to power of L, uh, this cup product, both have the same uh, uh, H2 class and H, uh, but the H4 class uh, are different uh, by, by the extra factor N H L. Okay. But this invariance too uh, show that you know, the whole of the data of all invariance omega Vn uh, for all values of beta and m, uh, but for fixed uh, n large enough can be captured in the smaller set of invariance omega zero and h churn two churn three, uh, where churn two plus n square h square where two varies in a, a finite group gamma. You know, we can easily show, you know, this is by the hard hard Lutcher's theorem that this group is finite. Okay. That's why all, all the enumerative information can be encoded in the vector of this uh, generating series, h uh, and h of beta of q uh, when, um, when uh, for for each values of beta in this finite group gamma, uh, we have uh, we, we need to just consider this series where m m m hat is is just a suitable normalization of chain three, which is uh, which is invariant under under the action of taking copper duck with uh, e to power of f. And uh, finally, the current expectation is that, uh, you know, I, I think at the beginning, the expectation was that we have a vector valued modular forms, uh, but um, I think it's now expected that we have such kind of result only for the case that the uh, chain one <coughs> is primitive, but since we always look at, look at n h when n is very large, it's very far from our case. I think uh, the current expectation is that uh, this tray is a vector valued mock modular form. Okay, um, I think I'm uh, done. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sahila. That was a very nice talk. I'm gonna unmute everyone and invite them to give you a round of applause. <sighs> Oh, 
Are there any questions? Um, so it seems there are. Sorry, carry on. Uh, so, so. Um, so, is there any question in the in the chat room? There are no questions in the chat, and I'm looking for people with raised hands, but there aren't any at the moment. Okay, well. Uh, if anyone has a question, I guess they can ask you during the break. Yeah, sure. uh, if not, thank you very much again, and we will break until the next talk. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Can you see this all right? Yeah, that looks yes. great, actually. Can you see the pointer? We can see the pointer, yeah. Fantastic, thanks.
Hi, Andrew. Good to meet you. Hi. How you doing? Good to meet you. I guess we're nearly ready to start back. All right. Should I share my screen now, do you think? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. That'd be helpful. Does that look okay? Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, it's perfect. We'll just wait a few minutes to let people grab their coffees or whatever. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. Okay, I think we're probably ready to get started again. So welcome back everyone to the uh, final talk of this session. We're very happy to have Andrew Knightsky from Yale, who's going to give us a talk on protected spin characters, link invariants and spectral networks. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, um, for the introduction and more generally, I'd like to thank all the organizers and everyone who worked so hard to put together this conference in really adverse circumstances. Um, uh, at least for me, it's been a fantastic conference. I've, I've learned a lot from all the speakers and I'm also kind of glad just for the opportunity to connect a little. Um, so grateful, of course, for the opportunity to give this talk uh, in which I'm gonna describe some joint work with uh, Fei Yan so the, the work involves a parameter in the group GLN will appear a lot. And uh, so part of the work is already on the archive, the part for GL2, and part of the work is still in progress, the part for bigger than two. But the basic story by now is pretty clear. So the goal of the talk basically is to describe just one construction, uh, but the construction can be viewed in a few different ways. So the most physical way of thinking about it is that we're computing something called the protected spin character, it's a kind of supersymmetric index that counts supersymmetric ground states, including keeping track of their spin for a system that consists of a, a supersymmetric n equals two theory in four dimensions uh, with a supersymmetric line defect inserted at, uh, at the origin. But another way of thinking about the construction is that it's a construction of a link invariant, um, not uh, for links in R3 or S3, which is the more kind of usual situation, but for links in a three manifold, which is a surface cross R. And I'm calling them link invariants in quotes. Um, it's in quotes because they're actually not invariant if by invariant, what you mean is just topologically invariant. So they depend on some additional data in contrast to the situation in R3. Uh, here, they depend on some additional data that'll be encoded in a kind of 
of uh, most concretely, it'll be encoded in a covering of the three manifold M. And although they're not invariant, they have a kind of completely controlled wall crossing behavior as you change the covering. So in that sense, it's kind of like having an invariant. Um, another kind of uh, offshoot of our construction will be, you can apply it even in the case of R3. And in that case, when the, when the parameter N is bigger than two, uh, you get a new way of computing. So sorry, for the parameter in that case, what you get is just so kind of well-known link invariant. Like for N equals two, it'll just be the Jones polynomial. And for larger N, it's some close analog of the Jones polynomial. But the way that you get of computing it when N is bigger than two is a new uh, method of computation. And finally, for those who like cluster algebra, is another way of describing this thing is that what we're doing is we're constructing kind of an embedding of a skein algebra into a quantized cluster algebra in a pretty explicit way. So that program. Um, and so I'm going to start out describing it from this physical point of view, the first. So the next, the next few slides, I'll be kind of reviewing the theory of this protected spin curve. So, so what's the setup? We start with uh, just n equals two supersymmetric quantum field theory in four dimensions. And we go out onto its Coulomb branch. And we go, in fact, to a kind of generic point of the Coulomb branch, where the infrared physics is just given by n equals two supersymmetric gauge theory, where the gauge group is just u1 to some power, the rank. And now we introduce um, a supersymmetric line defect of the theory. Uh, and think of it as uh, it's a line, but the line is extended in the time direction. So it just sits at the origin of the three-dimensional space. And so the, the usual physical interpretation of this would be that you have like a kind of heavy external probe particle, which is fixed to sit at the origin. And now you ask a question, what are the supersymmetric ground states of this system? And so you could that's a little more refined question. Um, since you're in the U1 to the R gauge theory, uh, the states are labeled by their electromagnetic charge. And if there happens to be some flavor symmetry around, then they're also labeled by their flavor charge. Uh, and so I'll use the letter gamma to denote the, the charge of the system. And so we can ask, what are the ground states with a particular charge, gamma? Now, there's a supersymmetric index around, which gives a kind of signed count of these objects. It's called the frame protected spin character. But it is, but I wrote the definition here. Um, it's the trace uh, over the Hilbert space of the system with the line defect inserted uh, at charge gamma. It's the trace of this particular operator minus q to the 2j3, q to the 2i3, where j3 is the genera generator of rotations around, say, the x3 direction, and i3 is the internal symmetry. And so what you get then for every charge, this gives you some function of q, a simple function of q, just a polynomial in a Q and Q inverse with integer coefficients. Now, so that's a pretty concrete quantity which you can try to calculate in the theory. And it has been studied from many different points of view by many different groups. So it's been studied uh, for Lagrangian theories by kind of semi-classical approaches. Um, it's been studied with quiver quantum mechanics using constraints from wall crossing. For class S theories, the case I'm going to describe, it, it's been studied uh, using spectral networks. Um, it's also been studied by supersymmetric location. Um, so there are many, uh, there are many works on this uh, subject. Um, one way of thinking about the problem, which is, would be kind of useful for my description is, you can think of it as you're kind of trying to find the UV to IR map, uh, not for local operators, but for the, for the line defects. Uh, so from that point of view, the way you think of it is, in the original theory, um, in the ultraviolet theory, you had your line defect L. And you've gone out on the Coulomb branch to some point. Uh, and it, when you do that, your line defect, um, its infrared description looks like, at least loosely speaking, it looks like a sum of the infrared line defects. And the infrared line defects are relatively easy to classify um, because you're just talking about the abelian, uh, the abelian theory. All you have are, uh, Wilson, Wilson took lines of the, of the abelian theory, which are just labeled by uh, their, their magnetic charge, the same, the same charge gamma that I was writing before. And again, you can add flavor charge uh, if there are flavor symmetries around. Um, so, so the decomposition is you start with the ultraviolet line defect, you decompose it into a sum of, you decompose it into a sum of the infrared line defects and the coefficients that appear in that decomposition are these um, frame-protected uh, spin characters. 
So just to give you an, what, this, what this kind of thing looks like um, in the, so one example you could take is the pure n equals two supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory um, with gauge group SU2. And then, um, so the answer, the answer typically depends on where you are in the Coulomb branch. So I'm just giving you the answer at one particular point in the weak coupling region of the Coulomb branch. So here, the infrared theory is just the U1 theory. So the charge is just uh, literally a pair of integers, the electric and magnetic charges. And uh, so if your ultraviolet line defect is, let's say, the supersymmetric Wilson line in the fundamental representation, then this decomposition turns out to involve three states. Um, two of them you might have expected um, on kind of semi-classical grounds just by decomposing the um, fundamental representation of SU2 um, into its two weight spaces uh, under U1. So you get, you get those states which have electric charge one and minus one, and then maybe surprisingly there's another state that uh, carries some magnetic charge. Um, so that result has been obtained by many of the methods that I described before. So here, in this case, we don't see any states with uh, non-trivial spin. So just to show you what it looks like when there's some spin. So one simple example is uh, the generalized archers douglas theory of type A1A3. So then the charges, there's electric and magnetic charge and also a U1 flavor charge. Um, so we have three integers. Um, and then for some effect, at some point of the Coulomb branch, the answer looks like this. So this decomposition has, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six states of uh, uh, spin zero, and then one, uh, one spin delta um, of various charges. So that's the idea of, uh, well, of course, they can be much more complicated, but this is the, the kind of object that you're, that you're looking for. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna be describing a new way of computing these things. And one of the very useful constraints uh, on what such a scheme can look like comes from thinking about operator products. And to describe the operator product, um, I mean, it's really a four-dimensional thing, but it's, but it's easiest to uh, describe it actually if I, reduce, uh, um, if I reduce on a circle to three dimensions um, with a twist by this operator minus q to the 2j3, q to the 2i3, the same operator that appeared in the definition of the spin character. Um, so, okay, so after I make that, after I make that reduction, if I think of a line defect wrapped around the circle, then it reduces in three dimensions to just a local operator. Uh, and now these local operators are only supersymmetric when they're placed uh, along the x3 axis because of this uh, uh, rotation that we made uh, in defining the, uh, the reduction. And so because they're supersymmetric um, and because the, um, the, well, they're annihilated by some supercharge Q for which the translations along the x3 axis are q trivial, uh, these local operators have a, a non-singular operator product, um, which, is, uh, which doesn't have to be commutative. So putting the operators L1 and L2, say in this order along the x3 axis, um, there's no way of uh, connecting that to the situation to an L1 uh, where their where their ordering is reversed um, without going through a singular configuration, so we get a we get a non singular operator product, but um, it can be um, it can be non commutative. It generally is non commutative. Um, on the other hand, you can show that it is associative. Um, okay, so we have some uh, um, some non commutative associated associative product on the space of these uh, liners. And they're all kind of complicated. Um, on the other hand, when we go to the infrared, in the infrared theory, the operator product becomes much easier to describe. Um, so in that theory, it's easy to say what happens when you bring two, two line operators close together. Uh, their electromagnetic charges um, and their angular momentum just add, um, except the one subtlety is that there's an additional contribution to the angular momentum that comes from the pointing vector. It comes from, if you have an electric charged thing and a magnetically charged thing, there's some angular momentum that's uh, stored in the fields. That's captured by this DSZ pairing. Um, and so the operator product between the X gamma one representing a line defective charge gamma one and X gamma two representing a line defective charge gamma two is an operator with charge gamma one plus gamma two, um, but with an extra factor of minus Q to the, um, 
to the parent. Of course, I'm into this extra angle. Uh, so this, this algebra um, is a pretty well-known algebra. It's sometimes called the quantum torus. So what I'm saying is the infrared operator product algebra is just the quantum torus. And so the, the, the key constraint that I'm going to use in uh, what follows is that this map from the UV to the IR ought to respect the operator product. In other words, if I have two uh, line defects, I can either first take their operator product and then flow to the IR, or I can first flow to the IR and then take the operator product. Uh, those two things are supposed to be the same. Um, OK, so, so far I've just been reviewing some kind of general story about um, line defects in general n equals 2 theories. Um, uh, and now I, I want to specialize a little bit to tell the rest of the story. So, so now I'm going to suppose that my n equals 2 theory is a particular one, um, or in a particular class, it'll be a theory that, of so-called class S, which is one that you obtain by taking the six-dimensional 2 comma 0 theory of type uh, GLN um, and compactify it on a, uh, on a Riemann surface. Um, or more pragmatically, you might say, you take the low energy limit of n five brains uh, that are placed so inside of a space time, which is the cotangent bundle of C across seven dimensional flat space time. Um, you put uh, n uh, brains on the Riemann surface C cross R three comma one, uh, and then take the low energy limit. Um, sometimes that's a useful kind of geometric setup for getting intuition about the story, and it'll be helpful here. Um, so, so then, and the other, one of the other basic ingredients in my story was I wanted to go on the Coulomb branch. Uh, so in this setup, going to a point on the Coulomb branch corresponds to um, a branched n-fold covering. So we have our Riemann surface C, which is sitting inside of the cotangent bundle. And now we're going to have an n-fold covering over it, um, which I'll call C twiddle sitting inside of the cotangent bundle. So in terms of the five brains, you would imagine that the n five brains just uh, move slightly off before you had n of them on the zero section. And now you'll have one of them wrapping this uh, covering inside of the cotangent bundle. Um, and so that can bring a name for what's called the, the cyber witten curve that describes the infrared dynamics over here. But what we'll use about it is uh, um, just that it's some branched n fold covering. Um, and so in this case, the, so I was talking about the line operators and the, and the operator product algebra um, in the UV and the IR. And in this particular case, the class S case, uh, that operator product algebra has a relatively concrete description as what's called a skein algebra. So uh, stated in the literature from many different points of view, from the point of view of AGT correspondence, from the point of view of uh, um, relations uh, with chern simons theory, where the skein algebra has first appeared. Um, and it's been, it's been uh, described by many people. I wrote some of them here. Um, so to understand it for our purposes, it'll be convenient to, uh, to think in three dimensions instead of two. So up till now, I was talking mainly about this uh, Riemann surface, but now let me combine the Riemann surface with the X3 direction of the four dimensional space time. Um, so, so then we have a three manifold, which is just the Riemann surface cross R. Which is still sitting as a factor inside of our uh, inside of our six-dimensional space-time. Now, suppose we're given a, a link, a framed-oriented link inside of this three-manifold inside of C cross R. Uh, then we we can make a line defect of the four-dimensional theory, uh, a super line defect uh, in the following way. Um, in the two comma zero theory, there are supersymmetric surface defects, and we take one of those surface defects and we put it on two manifold, which is, okay, so we have L, the link inside of M. And then in the remaining three dimensions, we just put the defect uh, along the time. So in everything I say, the time direction is basically, is just going to be uh, static. Um, uh, so, okay, so we have this um, uh, L cross the time, which is where we put the surface defect sitting inside of our six dimensional space time, which we can think of either as C cross R three comma one or as M cross R two comma one. Um, and now suppose we, suppose we look at this uh, surface defect uh, uh, at long distance. Um, so where is the surface defect sitting um, with respect to the 
four dimensions of R3 comma one. Well, this link is comma, so it may have some finite, it, it might be sitting uh, literally at, at a point in the X3 direction. More generally, it might have some finite extent uh, in the X3 direction. Um, but if you look at it at very long distance, that finite extent will just uh, uh, look arbitrarily short. So from long distance, this defect looks as if it's sitting at, sitting at the origin of the spatial R3. So from the point of view of the, of the four dimensions, um, at long distance, this thing looks like a, a and in general, this line defect doesn't preserve the SO3 rotation invariance. I certainly had one direction which was different from the other two, the X3 direction. Um, it does preserve U1 because the thing did not uh, move in the X1 or X2 direction. And it's quarter BPS relative to the eight supercharges preserved by the, um, uh, the class S theory. Now, there's an important special case which has gotten a lot of attention. Which is, Suppose that the, that the link actually was flat. Suppose that it was just sitting right at the origin, or at least it's isotopic to something that could sit right at the, right at the origin. In other words, suppose I really just took a simple closed curve um, inside, of my, inside of my Riemann surface. So in that case, of course, the line defect does preserve the whole SO3 rotation symmetry. In that case, it's half BPS. And uh, so that's the case that, that's been studied a lot in the class S story, starting with the work of Drucker Morrison and Okuda, who pointed out that um, in class S theories are exactly classified by simple closed curves in the Riemann surface. So, okay, so, um, so what we have anyway is associated to a framed oriented link uh, inside of our three manifold, um, we have a line defect in our four dimensional theory. And then um, now you can ask, you know, how to describe the operator product. And the operator product has a pretty concrete description in terms of the uh, in these links. Uh, namely, it's uh, the operator product algebra is the GLN Homfley skein algebra. So what is the what is the skein algebra? Well, to define the product of two links, um, what I do, so the links are in C cross R, and I just stack them one on top of the other um, in the in the R direction. Um, uh, but then uh, the links are taken modulo these so I, I wrote the skein relations here, which are uh, familiar from uh, the UN Trent Simons theory. And so, what does the relation mean? So, for example, if I look at this first relation, uh, what you're supposed to imagine is that you have two links which are the same everywhere outside a little ball. Um, and inside the ball, they differ just in that one of them has an overcrossing and one of them has an undercrossing when viewed, say, from above. Um, and then this, those, two, uh, those two links um, are related in the skein algebra. The difference of them is equal to a multiple of this third link where I resolve the crossing with a factor of q minus q inverse. And then there are other relations. This relation tells you what happens when you change the framing. Um, changing the framing changes the link by a factor of q to the n. And this one says that if you just have a little, if you have a little unknot sitting inside of a ball, then you can erase it um, at the cost of multiplying by this um, okay, so that's a relatively concrete kind of geometric description of what this what the uh, uh, operator product uh, algebra is in this theory. Um, ah, sorry, right. I should say um, for n equals two, uh, I think this is the whole OPE algebra. For n bigger than two, this is just part of the OPE algebra. In general, you would uh, have to include also kind of net, more complicated networks of Wilson lines. So in the story I'm going to tell today, I'm not going to deal with those networks, although. Uh, it's possible to extend what I say to include those networks. Now, in the infrared, uh, so I, I'm trying to describe a map from the ultraviolet algebra, which is the skein algebra I just described, to the infrared algebra. As I told you, the infrared algebra is supposed to be much simpler. Um, and here's our description of it that'll be convenient uh, for us, is to think of it also as a kind of skein algebra. But now it's a skein algebra not of the original Riemann surface, but rather it's a skein algebra of the covering. And loosely speaking, you would say it has to do with kind of U1 turn Simon's theory on the, on the covering instead of UN turn Simon's theory uh, on the base. Um, and so this one has somewhat uh, simpler relations. In particular, if you want to change a crossing, you can freely change the crossing just at the cost of a factor Q squared, or you can resolve it at the cost of a factor Q. Um, there is 
a somewhat tricky sign in the story, uh, which I think I don't want to describe uh, um, in detail. Well, I'll just say so. There's there's a distinguished locus in this uh, um, in this covering three manifold, which is the branch locus of the projection uh, um, from M twiddle uh, down to M. This, this cyber witten curve is in general a branch covering, and so there's a there's a branch locus here. And when you move the Wilson lines across the branch locus uh, in this story, you pick up a minus sign. Um, okay. Uh, so from what I just told you, you know, uh, from everything I just told you, uh, the GL1 scheme algebra of the covering, C twiddle cross R, which was supposed to be this infrared, uh, this infrared OPE algebra has to be isomorphic to the description I told you before, the quantum torus. So just to say that's indeed true, it's true in a pretty simple way. For every, the, the, uh, the charges, the infrared charges of the theory correspond exactly to just loops on the spectral curve. Uh, homology classes of loops on, homology classes of loops on this covering, the cyber witten curve. And so for each loop, uh, we, could just, we could just take the corresponding element of the skein algebra represented by that loop. And I'll call that X gamma. Um, there's some care needed with these tricky minus signs, which I'll suppress. And then the scheme relations right away imply the relation that I wrote for you before, having to do with the pointing vector. Um, X gamma one times X gamma two is X gamma one plus gamma, gamma two up to, up to its uh, power of Q. Where now the DSZ pairing, um, the, the pairing between electric and magnetic charges, uh, that role is played just by the intersection pairing on the homology. Uh, okay. So summarizing where we are, um, now just in kind of geometric terms, the kind of problem I'm setting up. Um, so we have a three manifold, uh, which happened to be C cross R, um, uh, with a branched n-fold covering. And looking for is the UVIR map, which takes, you take loops downstairs, you take a loop downstairs, um, and you map it to some uh, formal sum of loops upstairs. Uh, with coefficients that are valued in the, that are Lamarck polynomials in Q. And this map is supposed to be constrained. It's supposed to be a homomorphism between some algebra structure, some kind of complicated algebra structure defined on the base, the GLN scan algebra, to some very simple um, algebra structure on the loops uh, on the cover, the GL1 scan algebra, which is the quantum torus. Okay, so okay, so so that's the that's the geometric problem. Um, and now I want to describe a method of uh, computing the UVIR map. So as I said, this is a story that we carried out completely for n equals two, and we have most pieces working for n equals three. I'll tell you some as we go along. Um, and okay, some parts of it also work for higher n. So our hope is that what we've done for n equals three basically will, will work for all n, but we'll see. Um, but I should say right away that many ingredients in this scheme have a uh, have appeared before. Um, so in particular, uh, if, we if we solve this problem without the spin information, if, say, if we set Q equals one, which is kind of the commutative, then these algebras become commutative. And then uh, the story is basically the story of abelianization and, and spectral networks in my joint work, uh, um, David Eroso and Greg Moore. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we take this three manifold, the simplest thing we could do is just take the three manifold to be R3 so then it doesn't literally have an interpretation in terms of class S, but still you could make the same setup with a, with a surface defect now just in six dimensional space. Um, and then in the case of N equals two, uh, what we'll recover is just the vertex model for the Jones polynomial. Uh, and it's a kind of reinterpretation of it using the two zero theory. And basically this reinterpretation already appeared in work of Witten and uh, particularly in work of Gato Witten. Um, Okay, so, so on the one hand, many of the ingredients we're using have appeared before. Um, on the other hand, in some cases, the answer has also appeared before, but obtained by a quite different looking method. So in particular, again, so now if in the case of a Riemann surface cross R with N equals two, uh, uh, Bonahone and Wong invented this thing called the quantum trace, which is more or less the protected spin character in that case. Um, uh, um, so in the Coulomb branch, there was a theory developed by Maxime Gabella, um, which involved, roughly speaking, using the spectral networks plus some 
uh, quantum group R matrices that were kind of put in by hand. Um, so this work actually started as a way of trying to understand better uh, Gabella's construction. Um, okay. So, okay. So I want to explain how, how we're going to compute this uh, protected spin character. So as I defined it, the protected spin character is uh, a trace, the trace over the Hilbert space of the two comma zero theory formulated on this, on M cross R two comma one with a surface defect inserted along L cross the time. And so to compute it, you know, one thing you could try to do is you know, essentially from its definition, you have to find the time on a circle, including this twist around the circle uh, and compute a, you compute the partition function. So if I think of, of reducing the two zero theory um, from six dimensions to five dimensions, it that's believed to reduce to computing the partition function in five dimensional n equals two supersymmetric Yang mills. Now, super Yang mills with gauge group UN um, formulated on M cross R2 with uh, a twisting and an omega deformation. It's omega deformed because of this uh, uh, twisting by uh, the rotations. Um, and then we're studying it uh, um, with some additional symmetry breaking turned on. Uh, so some symmetry breaking scalars turned on determined by the covering M twiddle going to M. Uh, and then we've inserted a Wilson line defect uh, along this uh, link. Okay, so roughly speaking, what we're trying to do is five dimensional n equals two super Yang mills with a Wilson line. Um, okay, so in that situation, there's a kind of natural zeroth order guess at what the physics might be. Um, what you would say is, okay, well, I'm going out on the Coulomb branch of the five dimensional uh, Yang Mills. Um, that breaks the UN gauge symmetry to U1 to the N. I say locally because this breaking scalar is very as I move around on the, uh, as I move around in space. Um, but locally, it's breaking UN to U1 to the N. Uh, and so it decomposes the fundamental representation just into its N different weight spaces. In different charges under the uh, u1 to the n, uh, which is correspond to the sheets of this covering manifold uh, in twiddle. So what you would think, uh, so the first possible guess at what the answer could be is that uh, the Wilson line is just in a decomposed infrared into n Wilson lines of the u1 to the n theory. Um, in terms of my kind of geometric setup, what that would mean is, okay, we have this, we have a link lying on the base manifold m, and we should just lift it up to the covering in all possible ways. So just lift it up to each sheet of the covering. Um, so that's what I denoted here. Here's you know a little arc. Whoops. Yeah, that doesn't work. Here's a little arc of the of the link. Um, and here we're lifting it to sheet. Or in terms of these charges, you would say it has kind of n different charge spaces, and this is uh, charge space uh, I under the u1 to the n. Um, now you very quickly see if you try to use this guess that this is this is not the right guess. For example, it, it doesn't satisfy the scheme relations. It's not even isotopy uh, invariant. Um, but there's a small modification of this guess which seems to work, uh, and that is to include corrections coming from the massive W. Um, so the W bosons are in the in the adjoint representation. So they're uh, they're labeled by um, you know one of the weights of the adjoint. Uh, in other words, uh, two sheets I and J of this uh, of this covering. So each W boson is carrying a labeling by I J, where I and J are two sheets of the covering. Now, the sheets of the covering are described by the symmetry uh, the symmetry breaking scalars, which um, in this twisting is like a field um, on uh, again a vector field on M. So another way of saying this is what I wrote right here that. M twiddle, the covering, is sitting inside of the cotangent bundle. And I'm taking M to be a Riemannian manifold. For example, C was actually a Riemann surface. Um, so it had, a, it had a conformal class of a metric, and the conformal class, won't, the choice of metric inside that conformal class won't matter. So I can identify that with the tangent bundle to M. And so each sheet of this covering is being a vector field uh, uh, on M. And then the BPS condition is that these W bosons have to travel along special trajectories what I'm calling BPS IJ trajectories, which are just the flow lines of the vector field VI minus VJ. 
And so the, these W bosons can kind of transport charge between different arcs of the link. Um, so that's what I've shown on the right here. Here's two different arcs of this link. And here's an IJW boson that kind of trans that, uh, transports the charge. It, it kind of swaps I and J. So here I have, a, I have a, the link in charge sector I, and then it swaps over to here. And here I have it in sector J, and that one swaps over to here. Um, and then um, what they can also do is mediate interactions with the, the locus on M where the symmetry is partially restored. So that's the branch locus of this covering, which I mentioned earlier. So if you have a place where um, sheets I come together, that can emit an IJ, a W boson of type IJ. And then the link by interacting with that can change from uh, charge I to charge J. Okay, so altogether, the proposed shape of our answer is that if you have a if you have a link L representing a UV line operator, to get the corresponding to get its infrared decomposition, you have to sum over a bunch of different links that are covering. Which links do you sum over? They're all the ones that can be assembled from these two different kind of constituent. So on the one hand was just directly lifting. That was the kind of naive answer. Just directly lift the link from L from M to M twiddle. And the other is to include these W boson trajectories. Um, and each L twiddle then comes equipped with a, with a framing, which I won't try to describe, uh, and also a kind of uh, tricky factor, kind of a weight factor, uh, which because it's the thing that was by far the hardest in this uh, project, I have to tell you at least a little bit about it. Um, so, Yeah, so, um, so each of these lifted links comes with uh, various weight factors. And so, for example, in the GL2 story, um, there is, there's a factor of Q to the winding number. Uh, now, uh, so you have to say what you mean by the winding number. But in this situation, there's a way of defining a kind of canonical projection. That you take the winding number in that projection. Um, there's a factor of Q minus one over Q for each of the W boson trajectories that connects two ends of the, of the link. There's a kind of tricky factor having to do with the framing, um, which I think I won't say too much about. Now, so these factors, we determined them by a kind of bootstrap method. So we didn't know a priori what these factors should be. Um, and so we determined them just using all the constraints that we know that this UVIR map should obey, particularly that should obey the scheme relations and should obey the isotope invariants. Um, it would be much better to derive them in a more fundamental way. I mean, for example, by some computation in this omega deformed five dimensional Yang Mills theory. Uh, one thing I'll say about it is that at least part of this story has been explained in a physical way. This factor of Q minus one over Q also showed up in Gato Witten's work. Um, in the case of R3. And then they explained it in terms of um, uh, fermion zero modes from the broken supercharges that were present in their story. So ideally, some similar explanation is going to apply in our, in our case. It would be very good to understand all these factors in some uh, kind of top-down way. Um, Andrew, just now, okay, so all that was the story uh, for, for what, thank you. Uh, so what I told you in detail was the story for uh, GL2. Um, for GLN, the story gets somehow much more interesting because we have to include, in addition to the, uh, in addition to just single W boson trajectories, we have to include also kind of webs of W boson trajectories. Um, so here's a picture of the kind of thing that you have to include. Um, and again, by this kind of bootstrap uh, uh, method, we we know what factor has to be assigned to one of these webs. It's Q minus one over Q to the power m, where m now is the number of leg minus the number of these trivalent internal vertices. Um, so it'd be very nice to have a sort of universal explanation of this. You know, maybe, for example, there's kind of two fermion zero modes on each leg and some universal interaction in each vertex that lifts two of them. Um, and then you also have to include various kind of winding number factors. Now you have winding numbers in many different projections that all have to be uh, added. Um, so it's a somewhat intricate story. Um, now, I wanted to show you. Uh, uh, just to give you some feeling for how this thing actually works, what kind of thing it is in practice, I wanted to show you quickly just a couple examples of it. Um, and then I guess I'll be done. Um, so let me talk about the case R3, um, really the case that Gato Witten studied, when n equals two. 
Um, so then the, the, the simplest thing you can do is just take these symmetry breaking vectors to be literally just constant vectors. And so then this covering, I spent a lot of time talking about a covering, uh, m twiddle over m. Uh, when m is r3, we can take it to be just covering, just literally n copies of r3 placed at different points in the tangent bundle, according to these vectors we have. Um, and so then the physics, we're really talking about the 2, 0 theory in r5, comma 1 with the surface theory. Um, and in this case, the, this Steen algebra that I've been talking about, all the interesting stuff in the Steen algebra came from homology classes of loops in the cover. In this case, there's no homology classes of loops in the cover, um, or they're all trivial. And so the Steen algebra is just polynomials in uh, polynomials. In and then in, in this case, the answer that we're supposed to get is just a very familiar link invariant. Um, it's essentially the Homfley polynomial. It's a specialization of the Homfley polynomial of the link. So for n equals two, it's essentially the Jones polynomial. Um, okay, so let me show you uh, uh, how that happens in this in this setup. So here's an example where I took n equals two. Now, when n equals two, uh, so the symmetry controlled by these two vectors, v1 and v2, only their difference matters. I can just take it pointing along the x-axis. Um, and let me take this uh, polygonal unknot. So in this case, there's just, um, uh, so I'm drawing the projection of this unknot to the x and y plane. And there's, uh, now what happens depends on how it moves in the, uh, in the z direction, which I haven't shown you. But I'm showing you an example here where there's, um, where there's just, one possible boson trajectory. Here it is. Um, in this case, we wind up summing over uh, um, just three different lifts. One where we assign the whole link charge one. One where we assign the whole link charge zero. Sorry, the the I've labeled the sheets as zero and one. Um, and one where there's this exchange process. Uh, part of it is on zero and part of it is on one, and they swap. This W boson swaps them. And so you sum up. You know, you you use the rules to evaluate the contribution of these three lifts. And sure enough, you get the unnormalized Jones polynomial of the unknot, as you expect. Um, if I draw the same picture in the YZ plane, um, it looks a little different. Now we don't see the exchange because the exchange was going in the X direction. Now that's into the board. You just see a kind of local interaction at the crossing where the sheet labels are allowed to change. Um, and using this projection, our description of, of the UVIR map just reduces to the vertex model. This is essentially the story that the Kretzel and Witten explained. Um, so the new thing now is to do it for uh, um, the new thing in R3 uh, is to do this uh, for n greater than two and to take the symmetry breaking vectors to be uh, all far apart. If they're nearly collinear, we get again an analog of the vertex model. That's what I wrote here. Um, but for more general uh, symmetry breaking, we can get more complicated contributions. So here's a couple pictures of those. Um, uh, so. Uh, We've done experiments of this kind on, on the computer. And you do, in fact, recover the known not polynomials, but you recover them in kind of a new, in a, in a new way. So this is a new scheme for computing these, uh, these uh, not polynomials by summing over these kind of intricate uh, uh, webs of W bosons. Um, all right, so I'm basically out of time. So I'll, I'll skip. These are some examples of what the story looks like if you do it uh, on a Riemann surface cross R. Um, and Okay, uh, yes, it suffers from wall crossing. It's the wall crossing is controlled by the conservative Soilman formula. All right, so so the summary. Um, what did I tell you? I told you about some joint work with uh, with Feiyan, uh, which is partly done for n equals two and partly in progress for higher n, where we compute something that you can think of in various ways. It's either a protected spin character counting BPS states, or it's a link invariant um, for links that are placed in the three which is a Swiss cross R, invariant in quotes because it has some controlled wall crossing, or it's a new way of calculating the link invariant for links in R3, or um, it's a way of embedding the Skeen algebra into the quantized cluster algebra. That's essentially the story of wall crossing, what I didn't manage to say. Um, all right, I think I'll skip the sort of potential future stuff um, and just say uh, many thanks, and uh, uh, I hope that we're able to meet again in person before too long. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I'm going to just unmute everyone and ask you a round of applause.
just see, we've got a few questions. Uh, so I'll just, Edward Witten is first. I'm just gonna unmute you, Edward. Um, okay. I just had a very naive question about the beginning. You had the spin, ISO spin one half Wilson line of SU2. Then in the IR, it was the sum of three terms, two obvious ones and one with magnetic charge. What does that mean? Does it mean that there's a bound state of a monopole and the, or I should say a, a square integrable state, a square integrable uh, state of the monopole in the presence of the Wilson operator? Um, I, I'm afraid that the way that we got that answer, I mean, we, we got it in a way that was sort of far away from the semi-classical uh, uh, picture. And even though I said that the answer is a weak coupling, um, that was that fact wasn't really used much in the in the computation, so I don't really understand the kind of weak coupling interpretation of it. But this is really the person this is a question for. I think is um, Greg, who with collaborators um, studied exactly this question, the kind of semi-classical description of the frame BPS states. Um, well, unfortunately, I'm not the one to answer it, but hopefully Greg can tell you. Uh, well, Greg is online, so maybe he'd be willing to comment. But I I can't imagine what it could be except a bound state of the, uh, sorry, a discrete state, a discrete supersymmetric state of the monopole in the presence of the Wilson operator. It sounds very reasonable, but because I haven't thought carefully enough about it, I don't want to- I think Greg has raised his hand. So he either has an uh, They let me unmute myself. Uh, yeah. Edward, the answer is absolutely yes. And uh, the Dirac operator on the frame monopole moduli space has a bound state, L2 bound state. Uh, I see. Uh, I see. So the monopole operator, I think you told me before, becomes a vector bundle in the monopole moduli space. And you look at the Dirac operator coupled with that vector bundle? Yeah, exactly. And you, you can show that there's an L2 bound state. Okay, nice. You can even construct it quite explicitly. I see. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Asan Khan. I'm just going to unmute you. you. Can ask a question. Hi. Uh, so, in your talk, you described uh, uh, how the uh, OPE of line operators leads to uh, this uh, algebra structure on the scheme uh, scheme module, right? Um, so, I was wondering uh -huh. if you can. Uh, another thing you can do, however, is to, other than considering the OPE, you could. Uh, you could put two line defects together at a junction and ask what local operators live on that junction. Um, so that I would guess leads to a bilinear product on the scheme algebra. Uh, do you know some description of this, uh, such a bilinear product? So say again, the construction of the product. So you, you just consider uh, local operators that can live on a, on a junction of line defects. So I'm thinking of sort of like a hom of hom between two lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, I think those things have been studied. Um, but yeah, but I, but I haven't studied them. And I, I, I don't, I don't know exactly the, the best reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I, it, I would think it's some sort of linking number of knots, so something very simple. Uh, just, Okay, thank you. Okay, next is Theo. You can unmute yourself. Uh, great. So, um, my thank first. Thanks for the great talk, uh, Andy. Uh, so, the, my question is the the skein algebras are are just a piece of a sort of larger object that you might call a skein category. Um, where the scheme algebra is like one specific endomorphism algebra in that category. Does that, do those, do you have like a UV to IR map for the whole scheme category? Uh, I don't, uh, uh, unfortunately. Do you think the same, I mean, if, if somebody wanted to do it, would they be able to press these ideas or, or is there something? Um, well, let's see. So, 
is the interpretation of this. So one interpretation of these uh, scheme, scheme modules attached to kind of general three manifolds, uh, as I understand, is that they arise at the space of states in a four dimensional topological field theory. Mm -hmm. um, now, it certainly could be possible to uh, develop a version of this kind of abelianization story that applies in that topological field theory. And I mean, so I guess I, I guess uh, I have to ask a question to you, which is the of the category you're describing in terms of that topological field theory. Um, yeah, so the, the, the objects in the category, um, so the classical limit of that topological field theory is studying character varieties and actually character stacks. And this is like a kind of quantum version of the character stack, whereas the skewed algebra is a quantum version of the affinization of the character stack. Okay, so, so if the construction you're after has an interpretation in that, um, in that topological field theory, then I would kind of tentatively guess that the answer is yes, that you can do this abelianization also there. Okay. Um, uh, although I, so I haven't pursued that much. Um, I, I had some conversations with, on the one hand with uh, Davide Gaiato and on the other hand with David Jordan, which I think are, were about this question. Yeah, so I mean, David Jordan is definitely an expert on this question, on these categories. Anyway, thank you. Is a question from Aaron. You'll unmute yourself. All right. So I think um, Theo may have just answered this question, but I'm not sure. So I have, in an effort to try to understand the physics of this stuff a little better, I had a three part question. The first, am I understanding or am I recalling correctly that the this IR scan algebra is the quantum technular space of C? Um, I wouldn't say exactly that the IR skein algebra is the quantum Teichmuller space. I mean, the way I understand it, the quantum Teichmuller space is like a certain representation of the, the UV skein algebra, which on the other hand, it's very convenient to constructing uh, a version of this map. Um, so, I mean, this is more or less the point of view of like, uh, Fock and Goncharov in their story about quantized cluster algebras. They wanted to understand like the quantum Teichmuller space. Um, and so, yeah, they were using essentially something like this. The idea was that you have, um, well, I don't know how much I can say. Um, let's just say, essentially, I think that's the kind of representation theory story of this. So if you want to construct representations of the skiing algebra, um, which is what you want to do in uh, quantum Teichmuller story. One thing that you might try to do is to map it to a simpler algebra, which is the, in this case is this abelian scheme algebra, and then use some representation of that algebra. And I think that's kind of what's going on in this quantum Teichmuller theory. Um, except then you have the additional complication that because of this wall crossing, you have many different ways of mapping it to abelian scheme algebra. So what you really need is um, uh, you need for each way of mapping it to the abelian scheme algebra you need a representation. And then you need some kind of intertwining operators that connect the different choices. Um, and that's what's constructed in, um, in Fakken Gunterov's approach. And I think in some form also in like the uh, Teschner and Kleibrader's approach to this quantum type over here. Okay. So I was, I was sort of hoping that the, you could say something like one of those two theories, like either the UV theory or the IR theory is the quantum type Mueller theory of C, and then on on the other side, maybe you can find some description of the other theory and say that you know this UV IR map is relating the quantum type Mueller theory of C to this other thing. So is it? So are are you saying that the quantum type Mueller theory is the thing living on the UV side, or or is this completely like? Completely? I I think I mean to the extent that I understand what quantum type Mueller theory. Uh, is exactly supposed to mean. I, I, 
I think a big part of it is the representation theory of this uh, um, okay. uh, UV scan algebra. Okay, right, thank you. There's a question from Aswin. Do you want to unmute yourself? We can't hear you if you're speaking. At least I can't. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, very quietly. Okay, maybe in that case, I just type my question. Why don't you just go ahead to uh, we, we can somebody hear else's now. question? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, so my question is the following. Uh, so does this calculation suggest a, a categorification of uh, not invariance, and if yes, is it uh, new or is it related to non categorification I mean, so, okay. So the thing I was computing is supposed to be the dimension of some Hilbert space, right? So in that sense, the physics certainly suggests that it ought, it ought to be categorified. Um, the ordinary, in the, in the case where the three manifold was just R3, um, then the the kind of, you know, the, the statement that uh, that you get a categorified not invariant from the setup of a surface defect of the two comma zero theory in six dimensions, um, that's essentially the the known picture of categor categorification of not invariants coming from physics, starting with uh, Bukov, Schwartz, and Waffa, and Witten, and Gato, Witten, and so on. Um, so, so in that case, the categorification is supposed to be the same categorification that, that people were already studying. Um, now, I guess we are saying that these other knot invariants, um, the invariants that have to do with putting the knot in like a surface cross R, um, that those also ought to, ought to be categorified. Um, I, I think that's kind of a known uh, open problem to give a sort of good categorification of those frame BPS states. Um, I don't believe has been fully solved. It would be very nice to do it starting from this, uh, starting from this construction. That's kind of on our list of things to think about, but but I can't say that we've done it yet. Uh, Greg, did you have a question or was your hand just stood up from before? I just had a comment. Uh, so Andy and Faye have been doing the GLN case. Of course, maybe it's probably on his list of future directions that he didn't get to show, but I mean, an obvious future direction is generalizing to ADE. And um, Andy had this nice description of what used to be called the detour in terms of W bosons. And that seems like a good place to start. And in fact, uh, Pietro Longhi and Chen Park wrote a paper about ADE generalizations of spectral networks. So it was a comment, not a question. Yes, I fully agree with this comment. We did talk a little in the paper about how to kind of factor out from GL2 to SL2. There's some technical story associated with that. Um, but yeah, to do um, ADE is certainly a, a, I mean, something that should be possible. There was another question, but the Okay, yeah. So Minna, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, Andy. Um, uh, th thank you for a wonderful talk. I was wondering um, if you have um, uh, a way of um, uh, describing a sort of the intertwining between, um, I mean, the action of the mapping class group on the knot invariance you, you produce. Well, I mean, the, the invariant, the, if you're talking about what we actually calculated, what we actually calculated is just a number. So, um, or, you know, a polynomial, not like a vector space or anything. So I don't think that, I don't think that polynomial has any interesting, oh, sorry, you could ask, oh, sorry, I guess you could ask um, if you sit at a particular point of the Coulomb branch and act with the mapping class group, like on the line operators, um, how does that, how do the protected spin characters transform under that? But I would be surprised if there was any nice, um, if there was anything nice that you get from that. 
Um, um, I mean, certainly log if, you, if, you, if, if you look at invariants that, that just come from R3 and I embed it in, in, the, in the surface, then there's nothing new. But uh, presumably you're actually getting something new from invariants that, 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 that don't, don't, don't come from just R3. And, and then yeah, there should right. be something interesting. Well, okay, right. So, I mean, what's interesting about it is that the answer, okay, well, let me say what's different about the, the ones that, where you put the knot in, uh, um, in a surface. Um, so, of course, uh, one possibility, right, is that you actually just put the link um, in some little ball uh, in the surface cross R. Um, and in that case, you do get just exactly the same answer you would get in R3. So then the surface- Of course, yeah. Is, um, now, so the more thing is if you put it on some, you know, essential cycle, um, and then, you know, then the answer you get, right, is not just a, uh, is not just a polynomial in, uh, the wrong polynomial in Q, but rather it's, you know, it lives in this non-commutative algebra, the, the quantum torus. So what's new from that point of view is just the fact that, you know, the, um, the answer lives in a different place. But, but I, could, um, I could imagine drawing a very complicated knot on, on, on the surface of the Riemann surface, right? And then resolving it uh, a little bit and- Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it, it applied, I didn't draw any examples like that. I just drew the ones okay. that are flat. Um, but in, okay. I mean, in the paper, we did talk about some examples where, uh, um, where you know, it's not just flat, it's really the quarter BPS thing, right? And then the difference is that the answer that you get doesn't come out in a representation of SU2 anymore. Um, somehow morally, it seems like it kind of reduces to there's sort of the part that you can eliminate by scheme relations, and then there's the kind of essential part, which seems to be the you know just the flat links. Um, but I think what's not what's not trivial about that is that there is you know a single consistently defined object that you can assign to any link inside of C cross R that actually obeys all those scheme relations. Okay, uh, let me maybe ask, ask a different question. If I, um, I mean, is it, is it known how to <laughs> predict your invariance from which you can derive? I mean, I'm sure that one can work it out, but ha has it been worked out? In, in the papers that you have decided. Say the question again. How do you, can, how do you, you, you can, you can, right? I mean, with, <laughs> right. Um, I'm, I'm um, Right, I mean, here we're just using, in a sense. How do you know you get the right answer? <laughs> how do you know you get the right answer? Um, I mean, what we get is, I mean, I think it, it is the unique way of satisfying all of these uh, scheme relations, um, of giving a homomorphism from, you know, from this scheme algebra to another. Um, I say unique, I don't mean that it's absolutely proof, but I mean that um, uh, we tried pretty hard and I would be shocked if there's another way of doing it. Um, now, but, uh, you're asking, you know, can maybe we derive we could, it from uh, some... Sorry to interrupt, but maybe just in the interest of time, maybe we could discuss this in the breakaway session later. I mean, I noticed there's also uh, further questions for you. Um, but as we've got to start the next talk now, maybe we can, we, we are having a breakaway session this evening, right, Jeff? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we are, yeah, okay. Anyway, it seems it would be nice to just explain how to define these invariants, exactly the ones you're computing, just starting from the basic, you know, in, ingredients that, that, that go into... Um, you mean to define it in sort of a purely three-dimensional way as opposed to a six-dimensional yeah. way? Right. Um, right. And then say, well, here's, right. or uh, perhaps your construction motivates actually how, how you would do that. And it's, it should be some, some nice story about putting the, the, the known pieces um, in contact with what with, with, with comes out from six dimensions. Okay, that's what, I'm supposed to shut okay. up now, so I'll. I'll... Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thanks again, Andrew. Andy, can you stop sharing, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you very much to the speakers in the first session and to uh, Nathan for, for chairing the session. Our next session chair is David Morrison.
we'll introduce the next speaker. Uh, hello, Peter, are you there and are you ready? I'm here. I would like to share my iPad, not okay, my, uh, let me see if I can do it. Do I need some permission or can I just? Uh, are you logged on twice? Yes. Yes, yes. And Did both of them are co-hosts. Okay. okay. Sounds to be working. Very good. So our next uh, speaker is Pedro Vieira from Perimeter, who will talk about big operators in ADS-5 CFT4, which is a slightly different title than what had been announced. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a pity we cannot meet in person, hopefully very soon. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, the title is a bit different, but it, it means the same thing. It's just I forgot what the title was, and I was just writing it this morning. Absolutely. But uh, so it's about big operators, not too big. Uh, they, they are not going to scale with N, but still very big operators in N equals four super young mu. Because as I will tell you, when operators are big, we can make some analytic progress in trying to understand better the structure of this theory that we very much want to solve. OK, so, so let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do. And please do interrupt me if you have any questions at any moment. So we are going to describe, uh, always be considering uh, BPS operators in n equals four supreme mills, half BPS operators. So our operators will be the following. So we have the six scalars of n equals four superior meals, phi i. i runs from one to six. So these are the six scalars. We evaluate them at a single point in flat space. And we contract these scalars. We make a linear combination using a six-dimensional null vector. Then uh, out of this combination, with this complex scalar, we take k units of this uh, object, so this will be an object that will have dimension k. We call this guy OK, and we take a trace to make it a gauge invariant operator. So these are the operators we are going to study. These operators are half BPS. Their dimension, as I said, is precisely k. They are parameterized by these two vectors, a null vector that tells us in which direction it's pointing, and um, uh, position space that tell us where we are inserting this operator. And we will be considering this k here to be large. And let's discuss in a few slides how large it is. But it's going to be large, it's going to be a big number. And the key objects we are going to consider will be something like correlation functions, where I consider computation of, say, k1, tuck, 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 up to, say, k4. 4 will be the one that we'll be focusing on. So this would be a four-point function in n equals four super young. And that would be the key object that we would like to study. Now, if we think from the point of view of ADS, if this is ADS, putting one of these operators, inserting one of these operators at the boundary of ADS, this would be the boundary of ADS here, which is the flat space where we insert the operators. And then these operators would insert some closed string here. So they correspond to inserting a closed string. So this operator would insert a BPS closed string, or we can think of it as some supergravity mode, especially depending on how big K is. And here we could distinguish, of course, two obvious cases. K could be of order one. So if K is of order one, then we say that this would be a light, a light operator. Or we could have that K could be much bigger than one. And then we call these operators heavy. Their dimension, their energy is very big. And often we distinguish two cases. We distinguish further. When the operator is heavy, it can be Having different, it can be very, very heavy or it can be just heavy. So let's distinguish two further cases. Suppose we are at, in the regime where the toothed coupling lambda, let's go to the regime where lambda is much bigger than one. This would be the large radius limit of ADS, the strong coupling limit of the gauge theory. Then uh, we could imagine, for example, having scaling this K as lambda to the one quarter, 
or scaling it as lambda to the one half. And as I'm going to review, this lambda to the one quarter, this corresponds to short strings, whereas lambda to the one half corresponds to large, will correspond to large extended uh, string objects. Okay. And the intuition here is, as I said, this K is like the energy of the operator I put. So K large, but not too large would be like low energy. K large and really, really large is like high energy. And just to make this intuition even more precise, let's remind ourselves of how things work in flat space with respect to scattering in flat space. Because, okay, let me emphasize this basic thing. So what we have here, this, is like a process of scattering in ADS, right? It's the analog of scattering, but in ADS, I send five, four points at infinity, which is the boundary of ADS, and I send them in and they interact with each other. And so how does it work in flat space when we have, let's review a few things, a few simple things about the Zoro shop, you know? Okay, let's hope I have space. I won't write a few things. So. Let's suppose we have my Virazoro Shapiro amplitude, Virazoro Shapiro. It depends on the Mandelstam invariants, S, T, and U. Of course, they are not independent. S plus T plus U is equal to zero, but it's convenient to write it as a function of the three to highlight crossing symmetry, which is permutation of these objects. And then, uh, well, we have, we can package various particles that are related by supersymmetry by factoring out some supersymmetric delta function. Picking various elements of this delta function would tell you if you want to scatter the gravity and the exidiliton and so on. What do you want to scatter exactly? Then there is this famous factor S T U. So this result here is the supergravity result. And then uh, there are these famous gamma functions. So gamma one minus alpha prime S over four. And here gamma one plus alpha prime s over four. And then there is a similar expression, the gamma functions with T and similar gamma function PDO. Okay. Now, what does it correspond here? What are the two limits we could take here? Well, one limit we could take is the field theory limit. This would be the low energy limit where alpha prime times s is much smaller than one. Right, so we take this limit where the energy is uh, very small. And, uh, and what do we get here? In that case, this gamma function factor here, as we take low energy, it's convenient to write an equality where these gamma functions, they are exactly equal. Here, there's no approximation, but the approximation is in keeping a few terms of this expansion. It's equal to a sum of an expansion in alpha prime so there will be powers of alpha prime here. There will be here some powers of energy. So S to the 2N plus one, plus the same thing with T, plus the same thing with U. And here, there are the coefficients of this expansion. They turn out to be related to odd zeta functions. So there is zeta 2N plus one over 2N plus one. And this sum runs from one to infinity. And of course, the first few terms of the expansion represent the first terms in the low energy expansion, what we would get from correcting supergravity with higher derivative terms. So this is, of course, very well known. And many people like Michael Green and collaborators have studied a lot the nature of this expansion and all these zeta functions. And even beyond this, how they talk to uh, g-string correction. Then there is another limit we could take. Let's go up here which would be the high energy and a high energy limit where we will take s t and u all scaling in the same way and very big and we want to take now alpha prime s to be much bigger than one and this regime is uh, less uh, familiar to uh, to most but was also a regime considered by gross and mende so this would be a, a regime that gross and mende considered a long time ago where we are scattering strings at very, very high energy. And because the energy is so huge, we send these huge energies and we excite all the modes of the strings and the strings open up and they become big. So the, the relevant path integral configuration that dominates the string scattering is that of a big classical string that, um, and not a point-like field theory interaction. 
So how, how does the result look like in this case? The same gamma functions, the same gamma functions, let me write them now, another equal sign, but now it will be another expansion saying that these gamma functions are equal to the exponential. And then there is here a term, which is the area of this big, mass, big classical string, something alpha prime over four, S log of minus S plus the same thing with T plus the same thing with U. And this is what we would say, this here is what Gross and Mende computed. So let's call it the Gross Mende minimal area. Yeah. So here from the gamma functions, this is just Stirling approximation. We just take alpha prime s to be very big. We do a Stirling approximation, and we get the we get naively we get immediately this result. You can also obtain it. You just have the four vertex operators, and you integrate over the position of the fourth one. But the position of the fourth one, when the energies are very big, is localized by a saddle point, and the result of the saddle point computation would give you directly this gross Mende area without going through the gamma, explicit gamma function. Now, what you could do now also is not stop at the settle point, but capture the fluctuations around the settle point and all corrections around the settle point. And this would lead you to an another identity for these gamma functions that, to my knowledge, people did not write before, but of course, it was known for sure, for, but uh, which would be an expansion at high energy around Gross Mende. And now the expansion would be in inverse powers of alpha prime. The powers of energy are inverse powers of energy, plus the same thing with T, plus the same thing with U as usual. And the coefficients now are Bernoulli numbers, are the Bernoulli numbers with uh, some n and n minus. And in fact, it is fun to note that these terms here, these Bernoulli numbers, and these zeta functions uh, down here are actually not independent. And they are, in fact, analytic continuations of each other. So if you take these zeta functions and you continue them to negative values, you get this Bernoulli number. So what's going technically, one way of understanding these two expansions at once is writing the gamma function that exponential of some integral representation. And that integral representation, if you close the contour to one side, picking all singularities, you get one expansion. You close it to the other side, you get the other expansion. And because the integrand is the same, the two sides will be analytic continuations of each other. Okay, And this would be how you could, in this funny way, go from a high energy expansion and a low energy expansion. So these Bernoulli numbers capture all the information about the moduli space because the saddle point was fixing one point of the integration over the fourth point. But then the fact that it is not just one point, but all the moduli space that matters is captured by all these Bernoulli numbers that in principle we would have to keep if we wanted to get the full result. And um, I'm highlighting this because I'm, as I'm going to explain uh, in, a, in a few pages, uh, when we study this process in ADS-CFT, we can scatter some operators and there could be some region which looks like flat space if the strings scatter in a small region. And when they scatter in a small region, depending on how we approach it from ADS, from very big operators, very small operators, we could make contact with strings in flat space coming either from the high energy corner or from the low energy corner. So it's good to have in mind both expansions because we might want to meet flat space from different directions. Okay, so let, let me just draw a picture again. So a picture for what we just saw. We just saw that we have this, if we have this axis of energy, right? Which is like, again, it's morally speaking like our K, that we have here two, uh, we have the full Virasoro Shapiro amplitude for intermediate energies. And then for very at low energies, the strings become effectively point-like and we have low energy supergravity and corrections. Whereas at high energy, the strings open up and you have some big string scattering with some big opening of the strings. And here you have Gross Mende and its corrections. And there is a nice interpolation that we can understand in all possible ways because we have here an analytic expression. 
Okay. So, uh, so now, uh, what about ADS? Uh, so in ADS, we don't have the analog of Virasola Shapira. We don't know how to compute the correlation function of four operators at any value of the of the string tension, which would be at any value of the tooth coupling. We don't have that expression. And of course, we don't have one over n correction, which would be G string correction. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, what about ADS? And in particular, what about these correlations that we are studying? And let's define them to have all the same p just for simplicity suppose i have four point function and suppose we want to consider this at lambda very large and at n going to infinity so n is the biggest one so we are just doing planar now and i will comment on genus one a bit later and i can comment on higher genus at the end if people want but we are going to focus on strong coupling which is the regime where ADS is big and n going to infinity. And now I have, if you want, the main take home picture if, uh, of what the physical picture should be. And here we have, before we started with the formulas and then we made a picture because we had full control. Here we start with a picture and then we'll try to come up with the formulas if we can because uh, ADS is much harder than flat space and we cannot solve everything. Okay, so. Here would be the, the physical picture for the various regimes, how this, how you should think of these correlation functions, depending on uh, how big the um, how big these operators are. So if we start with small operators like p equals two, p equals three, we are describing Kaluza Klein, low Kaluza Klein modes of the graviton. So we are just scattering our gravitons in ADS, it is just super gravity. So here we would be studying some process that is not localized in any point in ADS and you have super gravity in ADS. Okay, then P starts to be large. And when P starts to be large, what happens is that these interactions, they want to propagate towards a region, maybe you cannot see, so towards a region, which would be the interaction region. So this would be, you can think that this propagation of these propagators become classical geodesics and they, they meet at whatever minimizes the cost of this propagation. And so there will be some region of interaction P and the Feynman, di the, the diagram, the Feynman diagrams, in this case, the Witten diagram would be localized close to this point. So clearly in a approach, starting to approach a flat space limit. This would still be in supergravity, but the diagrams would start to simplify and localize. Then we reach a regime where P is of order lambda to the one quarter. It's very big and it's scaling with lambda in a particular way. This, we will see in explicit formulas later, corresponds to reaching a regime where, again, we are interacting in flat space. And we are, in a, as an expansion in X, we are having access to the low energy expansion of flat space. So this would be how we would enter flat space and make contact with all these odd zeta functions that we arrive at low end. If P over lambda to the one quarter is X and it's of order one, then we would still propagate as close, as short, as very short strings, almost particles until an interaction region. And then in the interaction region, we would have the full strings with a Zoro Shapiro amplitude. If this parameter X is very big, and P scales with lambda. Now they would propagate still as short strings, but when they reach the interaction region, they would open up and form an open, close, an open classical string that would be given by gross mendes still in flat space. And finally, if P is of order square root lambda, then there will be huge centripetal force when we send these strings that will open them up and they will fill the full geometry of ADS. And so here we would be in a regime that would be like the analog. So it would be a minimal area in ADS, okay? Now these minimal areas in ADS, so we're not computed yet, even though it's a purely geometrical problem. So the problem is very well posed. You have a Sigma model. It is just a map from uh, two dimensions into ADS five times S five, right? You have this very simple Sigma model. 
But however, this IMA model is very nonlinear, and finding these minimal area solutions that end on four points at the boundary and that are big extended strings, this was not solved yet. So um, Joan Caetano and John Toledo solved part of the problem. They computed a bit half, you could say, of the results. This area contains an ADS part and a sphere part, and they computed, in some cases, the ADS part. But the full computation of this area is not yet known. So we cannot, it would be very nice if this was known, then we could start with these results and start taking P decreasing P. So here we would start taking P over square root lambda to be small, and we would make contact with flat space. So this is something for the future. But what we are going to do instead is start from supergravity and try to increase P and take P to be large and see how far we can go. And we would enter flat space through this other uh, corner, corner here. And I will only make some comments about these really big operators that generate these big classical areas at, uh, at the very end. Okay. But just to say that there, are there, is, there, is, there has been some recent progress about these minimal areas, mostly from uh, Frank Coronado, who understood from a different point of view, using the classical, using the integrability of the problem, how to get an expression for some of these correlators at any value of the coupling. And in particular, he could then take the limit of very strong coupling to get the, this, an expression that does exponentiate. And so we, we identify the exponent as being a minimal area. It was not yet computed directly from the Sigma model to check that this result is indeed in a, a minimal area. Um, OK. So let's do that. So the, 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 the idea now is we start with our four point function. And we will take the results that people over the past years have been computing. People have been studying using bootstrap techniques and uh, developing further supergravity techniques using Mellin space. There is now data. There are, exp there are, there are four point functions. Mostly people always, con typically people consider P to be small, typically P is equal to two is the simplest case people study, but now the technology is better and people have been studying also general P. So we can use this extra, this new tool to try to study how the four point function would look like when we start studying P, which is larger and larger so that we can get this 10 dimensional flat space structure. Okay, so the four point result, it's convenient to write as the free result, what you would get in free and meals if you set G to zero, then there are some simple kinematical factors. These are just um, one over x minus uh, x one minus x two to some delta powers and so on. So nothing and some supersymmetric delta functions, the analog of the supersymmetric delta functions of the uh, Virasoro Shapiro that I showed before. And then there is the interesting part, which would be an amplitude that depends on p. Remember, we are taking all operators to have the same weights. And now it doesn't depend on positions and no vectors, but only on cross ratios, on what is left invariant under the conformal group. So these are the cross ratios. And there are two cross ratios, u and v. And there are two R charge cross ratios. We can call them u tilde and v tilde. So this u would be something like the difference x1 minus x2 square, x3 minus x4 square divided by something like x1 minus x3 square, x2 minus x4 square. And u tilde, for example, would be similar with xi minus xj square replaced by these null vectors yi dot yj. Okay. And so this AP is uh, the object we want to study. That's the interesting part of the the part that carries all the physics of this uh, correlator. So that's the object we would like to study now. And so the first thing we did with uh, Francesco Aprile was we wrote this uh, A here. We understood that this A, as I said, people have been studying it in Mellin space, but we understood that it's convenient to write it uh, in um, a more ADS5 times S5 friendly, this uh, AP by writing it as some kind of super Mellin transform where we integrate, we introduce some parameters ds, dt, but new, two new guys, ds tilde 
and dt tilde. So these guys, this is the first two are the standard Malian variables. These guys would be what we would call the sphere Malian variable. And let me tell you what the definition of this is. So this is just a transform. So it's roughly a Fourier transform of these cross ratios or of the logarithm of this cross ratio. So there is something like u to the s, et cetera. And then the last one, v tilde to the t tilde. So this s, t, s tilde, t tilde are conjugate to u, v, u tilde, v tilde. Then uh, there is some gamma functions that I'm not going to write because there are too many. But uh, let me indicate this symbol to indicate many gamma functions. So here I'm hiding, uh, I think it's 12, 12 gamma functions. And I'm going to tell you what they do here. But it's some simple gamma functions of uh, S plus T minus P, things like that. So this is totally uh, determined. It's a definition of the object. If you want, you define this. So it's a function of S, T, S tilde, T tilde. But it's defined. And then times, and now instead of A, what replaces A would be the Malin variable MP that depends on S, T, S tilde, T tilde. So it is just a transform, as you see. Okay. So, uh, so these gamma functions, they have poles. So what's the physics, what's the meaning of these poles? So, so this, this, this gamma function has poles. And this MP, this one has poles in S and T, but not in S tilde and T tilde. And this one has poles in all variables. And so what happens is that when you write this integral, first, the poles in S tilde and T tilde transform these sums here. This integral becomes a sum, becomes a discrete sum if we pick the poles. So this is to be expected because the sphere, the, the object we started with is by definition a polynomial in these polarization vectors wise. There are a finite number of structures. So it should be a sum over all these possible structures, right? And so there should be a finite, but big sum, big because since K is very big, there are many structures, but it should be a finite, but very big sum. And indeed, these gamma functions are such that its poles precisely give you the sum that you want to get. S and T, they have poles coming from both the gamma functions and M. You see that poles in S and T will give powers of U and V, which are basically OP and OP expansion. So the poles here, so poles here, they correspond to the operator product expansion uh, in either channel, depending on how you close the contour, you could get poles in U or poles in V and so on. So schematically, what we, uh, what we have is we have some kind of integral, as I said, and then there are the, the, the poles and deforming the contour and picking the poles. For example, if this could be S, picking the poles in one direction gives you a new channel, an S channel OP, picking in the other channel, we have a T channel OP. And there are many poles, and you could have uh, many families of poles, and you are doing some kind of contour integral. And this is a bit schematic because it's a multidimensional thing, and so on. Now, what happens when we take uh, when we take uh, p to be very large is that the, the the object is not dominated by these poles, but rather it will be dominated by saddle points that complex saddle points that will be somewhere else. And so what will happen is that you will deform your contour to pass by these saddle points. And then your amplitude will be dominated by the value around this saddle point. And then it will simplify dramatically this expression because all these integrals here all these integrals here will become just totally localized by their saddle point expression. And so I prepared the expression here. So here is the result that we get. So let's digest it a little bit. So the last factor, it's obvious. It is just, I said that I have an integral of the Malin amplitude and I evaluate it at a saddle point. So what do I get? I get the Malin amplitude at the saddle point position, right? 
So that part is obvious. And here is the value, for example, of the saddle point. If I do the saddle point equations, I get this as star, for example. So this, I would call this S because it's related to the cross ratios U and V. I would say that this is an ADS saddle point. And there are similar saddle point equations for S tilde, T tilde, and so on that I would call sphere saddle point. So I take my Mellian amplitude and I evaluate it at the values dominated by this saddle point. And then I have another factor that comes from this gamma function that was this gamma infinity and also from the quadratic fluctuations around the saddle point. And so that would be, oh, I lost that. That would be this first factor, the first line. And now we want to identify this with some physics. And the proposal is that this first factor here, we should think of it as propagation in ADS5 times S5. Okay. So, and indeed, you see that this expression really looks like there are some parts like this one, which is ADS, and then some part like this, which is sphere, some part like this, which is ADS, some part like this, that is sphere. So this part really knows that it's a product of two spaces. There is ADS5 and there is S5. And then there will be this bottom part, and this would be describing interaction, the interaction part, and the interaction part now happening in this flat space region in 10 dimensional flat space. Okay, and that's the, the, the claim that, uh, that we have. And in particular, we will see that uh, for this to be true, this Mellin amplitude better simplify. And uh, instead of having these variables for the sphere and variables for ADS, they should combine into nice 10 dimensional variables. And indeed, we will see that here, we will have an S 10 dimensional, which would be S plus S tilde, et cetera. And the claim is that at large P, this object here now will only depend on 10 dimensional objects. Okay. <clears throat> so, So for example, let's do a check, a sanity check of this. For example, this Mellin amplitude has been computed by Rastelli and Zin and Zhu at the three level, which means large lambda and n to infinity. So here would be n to infinity, the planar limit, and three level and the leading power at square root of lambda. So it's really the leading term that would correspond to the one over STU in flat space. And what do we find? We find that for any P actually, it's possible to write this result in a nice way, which is one over. And then uh, using this 10 dimensional variables S 10 D, you get one over S 10 D minus one, one over T 10 D minus one, one over u 10 d minus one. Okay. And then you see that this definition of S 10 d is the sum of uh, S plus S tilde, the sphere and the ADS minus some variables. And at the saddle point, they are big, P is big. So these variables are big at the saddle point. And so this expression, which so far is exact, this is for any P, when I evaluate them at the saddle point, it becomes exactly one over S T U as in Virasoro Shapiro supergravity, right? As in 10 D flat space supergravity. Okay, when they become large. And more generally, the proposal is that at large P, MP will be one over this 10 dimensional S T and U times the rest, let's call the rest S. The rest, by the rest, I mean the, this stuff uh, here, and all these gamma functions, and also the one over n corrections to it, the g-string corrections, we will claim everything. 
So there would be all these variables of the 10 dimensional variables as the U, there is some prefix, some Jacobian factors here, and, and so on. And so that's the proposal on how this 10 dimensional uh, symmetry would uh, appear here, and how these variables are quite convenient, even at finite p, as you see here, but especially at large p to see this emergent 10 dimensional symmetry. This statement, by the way, that um, was made by Karanwot and his uh, student recently, which was the statement that at large n and large lambda, there is an emergent 10 dimensional conformal symmetry that allows to package all objects in a very 10 dimensional way. And here we are making the statement that that enhancement occurs uh, also at any value, at any term in the one over lambda expansion and at any value of one over n, if you are considering big operators. Of course, not if you are considering small operators. If you are considering small operators, as we said, we should really fill the sphere and so on. Um, uh, so finally, let me, I wanted to do a small computation, but I see that my time is running out. So I will not do, I will just tell you. You have about four minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to, I want to just tell you this because I want to comment on, uh, on the picture, on the big picture. So another check uh, we can do of this picture. So this was what I just described to you was a, uh, an explanation of this interaction part. And what we did to confirm it further was take all the results in the literature from this bootstrap and um, localization and so on for one over squared lambda expansion to check this picture. And we also computed some uh, genus one Mellin amplitude that would describe uh, uh, one loop supergravity. And uh, we also checked it against and it works. But what about this propagation part? Is it really true that I can identify this part as propagation? So there is a very nice exercise you can do where you start with a, a Witten diagram and you have an interaction point and these yellow lines represent exponential of the length of the geodesics. You find the minimum and you evaluate the action of this length of the geodesics at the minimum. And what do you find? You find precisely this factor here with the 2p, the exponent 2p. So that comes precisely from just the propagation of these factors up to the interaction point. And then it's quite nice that you can even do a little bit better and you can do fluctuations and study the fluctuations around this subtle point. And that gives you exactly these uh, prefactors here. And so this factor indeed can be identified with a propagation to a midpoint and its fluctuations of this propagation to an interaction region. Then uh, when these short strings meet in the interaction region, instead of putting just a contact diagram, we insert the full flat space S matrix. And that's the final prediction for what the picture should be. So let me go back to this, um, to this picture and uh, highlight that. So uh, what we are saying here is that um, uh, uh, as I'm uh, increasing uh, K, I'm going into a regime where I have small strings coming in. There is some propagation and fluctuation that is given by that prefactor coming from those gamma functions in Malin that governs the propagation and fluctuation. And then they reach the interaction part. And instead of putting a contact interaction, we should put the full 10 dimensional S matrix. Now it will be very interesting to carry further. So if we resum everything, we can get all the way to here or here, if you want, to this Gloss Mende, but we can't get past. If we start increasing further, then uh, this uh, expansion is not controllable. If P is bigger than Lambda to the one quarter, then uh, what we were doing, uh, thinking it was a reasonable expansion uh, at strong coupling breaks down and you need to resum everything. If you want to see this big extended strings, and the, only, the hope that we have is to start from integrability from this side and lower it in this direction, which is some work in progress that we are working on now. And the hope is that in doing that, we will get a full coherent picture of uh, these correlators at strong coupling and for any large P. 
that we hope will also shed light over the finite p structure. If you want to have the full result for these correlators at any value of p, which is, I think, would be the most fundamental object in n equals four, these four point correlators, then uh, having these boundary values for what should happen to them at large p would be very important. And of course, it would also be very important from the point of view of just understanding better holography and flat space holography and this flat space limit and this interpolation between low energy and high energy, even in flat space. So yeah, let me just uh, end by saying that, uh, uh, yeah, I, know, I think I'll, I will end here. If there are, we have 20 minutes for questions. I, if people are interested, I can develop further on any point. So thank you very much. Any questions, please raise your hand or ask a question in chat. Questions? I'm not seeing any questions. If you have a few more remarks you'd like to make, you're welcome to do that, Pedro. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, please. Um, thanks for a nice talk, uh, Pedro. So just about this uh, enhanced attendee symmetry, uh, what is the leading correction uh, in this large operator uh, discussion that breaks this uh, enhanced attendee symmetry? I think you're muted. Uh, Pedro, sorry, I muted you. I muted everybody. Sorry, yeah. It will be keeping one of the, it will, here it will be keeping one of these ones, right? Instead of keeping just STU would be, uh... ah, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, there are two different questions, sorry. One is, uh... so your question was, uh... When do we see the breaking of a tiny symmetry at finite p? So we see it right away. So it's only there really at the classical level, at the planar limits. As soon as you go beyond, there are some terms that still somehow have this symmetry because they are just like iterations of three level. Like if you just put two, three level together to get a discontinuity of one loop, then okay, some parts of that discontinuity will have this tiny symmetry. But if it's not some simple recycling of three level, uh, then the symmetry breaks away right away. So it's an accident that classically uh, flat space is conformally equivalent to ADS5 times S5, right? They're they related by a wild transformation. So right. if you are lucky enough and your process is not sensitive to this wild map, then mm -hmm. uh, you can get the same result, but uh, normally you are not. So it should break right away. And it does. But in this uh, large P limit, it will be restored. Right. At large p limit, it will be restored, yes, because but then it really it is restored in the sense that the result really factorizes into one part, which is not at all 10 dimensional flat space, right? It's really propagation. It's really right. a function of sphere over function of ADS. It couldn't be more ADS5 times S5. But then it factorizes into that times another contribution, and this contribution is restores this 10 dimensional symmetry. Right. So, so I have a, a related question. So this 10 dimensional P is could in principle contain terms that are not, that are not uh, analytic in, in the STNU? Uh, that's true, and they do. So for example, at one loop, you start getting the box in, in ADS, and you start getting logs of minus S and logs of minus T and so on. I see. And there is no contradiction because um, you see that we started saying that the Mellon amplitude is a meromorphic function. It just has poles, right? Right. But, uh, but we, are, uh, we are not close to the poles. We are here, far away from the poles, right? That's so true. We are here, far away from the poles. So as you go far away from the poles, from far away, these poles, very, it, it's not uncommon that these poles can look like a cut, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can form effective singularities just uh, by uh, condensation of poles. It happens all the time in matrix models, say, right? You have many 
eigenvalues and they condense into cuts and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So that's the mechanism as well here. You have these Malin amplitudes. At finite P, they are just meromorphic functions of uh, S, T, S tilde, T tilde. Mm -hmm. Then, and you go to the several points, effectively, they can become arbitrarily complicated. And you develop all these cuts and uh, all the structure that we expect for scattering amplitudes with all this non-analytic time. Right. Thank you. Uh, I have a follow-up question, uh, if I may. Sure. So, so this 10 symmetry would be probably absent uh, in the other case, like ADS4 or ADS7, but I guess most of your construction will still go through. That's right. So the, the, the uh, M theory as matrix that you should insert. That's right. So the, the, the enhanced, the, the, the finite P enhanced symmetry, symmetry should always be there because it is just equivalence principle, right? It's just we scatter at very high, if we scatter in a small region, it looks like flat space. Yes. Right? So, so I agree. But the, the, this, uh, there's no string worksheet anymore in the, you know, in a very large P limit anymore because it's N theory. Right, so we should see some difference in the, uh, yeah. So, so here, when I was describing, for example, gross mender, right? So right. where do we see that there is a big world shift? We see that uh, this expression at large energy has this big area term, right? Yes. Somehow that information is hidden in, in this expansion at low energy, right? Because it, 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 it's, if I keep the full expansion, it's the full result. Yes. So from M theory, we will end up on an expansion like this, but instead of this zeta functions, we have something else, right? That's right. But uh, it, it somehow it's a very different expansion because that expansion, if then we take the opposite limit, should not exponentiate and give some minimal area because as you see, as you see, because of what you just said, right? That's right. It gives something else and I don't, I don't have a good intuition. I don't have an intuition about what this expression, how I this, see. I mean, I, as I said, these are analytic continuation of this. Right. So in theory, we have some things here. And if we could guess an analytic continuation, it, we could uh, close our eyes and hope to be lucky and analytically continue the M theory terms to try to see what That's the right. That's right. Be. It'll be very interesting to see if there's, uh, you know, M2 brains, which also wrap internal directions that mm -hmm. anchor around these four points that it will contribute. I see, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Well, let's thank Pedro once more. Thank you. And the next topic talk is at the top of the hour. Hey, David. Hi. How are you? Do you want to try sharing your screen to see if we can oh, do that? Uh, yes, let me um, wake up the iPad first. Oh, are you logged on? Are you going to be logged on twice? No, because you don't have to for Zoom. You're sharing See. your screen through your own home network. Very cool. There you go. According to our system minute perimeter, um, best practice is to do it this way, where you're only logged on once, and you let Zoom handle the screen sharing. Um, I think but, that's pretty good too, but I've noticed that there's been a lot of variation. In this yes. And, and in fact, kind of logging in twice is a, is a perfectly good way to do it. Yeah. But I don't know. My, my sysadmin is like, do it this way if you can. And so I do whatever he says. I think that's always good advice.
but no, I was like, some of these programs, some of the sort of Zoom competitors just don't, you know, the, the only way to do it is to log in two or three times. Uh-oh, now I've got it done. Now you what? I have opened the chat window on Zoom, and I cannot close it again. Really? Because you can't locate where the button is, right? Because it, OK, I closed it. But it was hiding behind the <laughs> you are sharing screen I see. icon. OK, so my best practices are not very good. We have to practice well, our best practices, don't we? Yes. As you can see, I'm tired of being indoors, so I went out into my backyard to do I this understand. job. I understand. What's the time there, uh, it's, it's going on. It'll be 9 o'clock soon. OK. OK. What this means, Jeff, is that the first talk was at 5 a.m. for me every day this week. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's absolutely necessary. The only way to get most of the world in is to have the time that you did. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're actually lucky in the sense that we're nearly, you know, we're, we're nearly in the middle of everything. So if I, That's schedule right. It, That's right. if I schedule it appropriately, I can, and we work our way east to west, we can kind of get everybody <laughs> in. Yeah, a Asia gets kind of the short stick, but. That is true. We tried to do a conference at, um, at Perimeter in May and discovered that Ontario to China is exactly 12 hours. Wow. Well, I had a collaboration a couple of years back that was uh, proceeding over Skype and we had people in Tokyo, California, um, East Coast, and Milan, and okay. that ju there's just no yeah there's no, way, there's there's no, there's way, just to no way to do it. So the Tokyo guy was willing to meet at midnight his time. So that that's mm -hmm. what became the default. Yeah, I mean, I definitely our our speakers from Taiwan and Singapore and so on all just ended up talking at nine p.m. their time. Yeah which was 9 a.m. for us, which was fine for, for our audience. But, but I'm now yet another hour off the neck because we've now moved to Halifax and I'm stuck at home for two weeks because Nova Scotia, even for people coming from other parts of Canada, Nova Scotia is insisting on a two week isolation for people. Who well, you know, we have state by state things like that. Yeah. So if you're entering New York from some list of about 40 states, you have to quarantine for two weeks. Yeah. But it's okay, I managed to find the only part of the house to put behind me that's not a, a kind of hurricane of boxes. Because we arrived, this is where we arrived, yes, uh, Wednesday, Tuesday night. Uh-huh. Well, back in March, I gave a PhD advancement exam and the student was quarantined in China. So uh, Chinese students, a lot of them went back to China in around March, but then they were coming from abroad and they were forced to quarantine for two weeks. So uh, we gave him his exam from his quarantine hotel room. <laughs> wow. Yeah, at least for us, like I'm allowed to just spend the two weeks opening boxes. I just can't, you know, I have to have friends deliver groceries to me. Right. So I can't ask you how Halifax is because you haven't seen it yet, right? I, you know, it's, um, it's unusually warm. In fact, they set a new all time record for heat last week. It wow. was 86. Wow. 
So yeah. that gives you a sense of what Halifax. No, is I, I I've been I visited Halifax, so I I'm I'm aware. Yeah, eighty eighty six sounds warm. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the ocean breeze? <laughs> I feel like it was eighty six when I visited you in January. I see. Yeah, that could be. Year round, I don't know. No, I mean, no. like for you guys in Santa Barbara, I think it was eighty six when I visited. Oh, it, it, so. 80s in January is okay. Maybe when you were there, yeah, you were here rather. 80s in January is is unusual, but is not unheard of. Okay, we're having this friendly conversation uh, okay. in the presence of 90 other people. <laughs> That's true. So uh, let's suspend it for a few minutes, and we'll start your talk okay. uh, right at the top of the hour. And Theo, I'll try to give you a five minute warning at, toward, toward well, the end. Great. Um, in Pedro's talk, I was not looking at my watch, so I didn't actually do it on time. I think Pedro had to start late, right? Because the questions with Andy went so long, so. Uh, it wasn't very late, it was just slightly late, yeah. Who's that? Yeah. Hi, Zahabi. Hi, Richard. Hello. Who did you say that was, Zahabi? Theo. <laughs> That's right. Can Think. you wave hi to Theo? Hi. I'll just yeah. say hi. Now, is, is Zahavi a registered participant for the workshop? I mean, <laughs> no, he's piggybacking off me. Okay. I, I'm going to mute you, Richard. This is fun, but we got got to get started. Yep, sounds good. OK, welcome back. Uh, we're very happy to have a, as our next speaker, Theo Johnson Fried, who will talk about mock modularity and a secondary invariant. So thank you very much for, for the introduction and for um, the chance to speak. I also, since I'm the last speaker, I get the pleasure to, to thank the organizers, um, to Jeff and Nathan and everybody um, on behalf of everybody. So if it's possible to unmute everybody to applaud for them, that would be really yes. great. I've just done that and let's please applaud. Now I will mute everybody again, which means Theo, you have to mute yourself. Unmute yourself, rather. Great. So, um, right. So, I'm going to talk about about mock modularity um, and a secondary invariant. And the most of what I'm going to say is based on joint work with David Gayoto, 
Um, I also want to say I despise slide talks. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. I'm really excited for when we can all go back to giving jock talks to each other. Um, the reason I despise slide talks is because I can't go back on my own and see what people said. So if you're like me, please download the slides. I put the link up and, and you can flip through them at your own pace. Um, okay, now I'm going to remove the link. So my plan for the talk, I'm going to say, I want to tell you about, about a new invariant that's a secondary invariant, secondary meaning that it's uh, um, comes from the Witten index, but it's a, a kind of secondary version of the Witten index. So the primary invariant would be the Witten index. Um, and it's an invariant, a deformation invariant of, of supersymmetric field theories that, that we discovered. Um, so I'll say, I'll say just a little bit about what I mean by deformation invariant of supersymmetric field theories and about the space of, of supersymmetric field theories that I want to think about. Um, and then I'll spend most of the talk kind of first reviewing what I think most like something that I think you are all, almost all of you are probably very familiar with, which is the Witten index itself or the elliptic genus or whatever you want to call it. And um, then I'll tell you our new invariant. And then at the very end of the talk, I'll just say some kind of obscure things about mathematics. So, um, so the context of the talk, uh, the context of the problem, the, the, there's a very general problem that I think a lot of people would be interested in, in knowing ways to solve. So um, given any, any quantum field theory, you, but in particular, any supersymmetric field theory, and in my talk, I'm only going to care about one plus one dimensions, unitary field theories with minimal supersymmetry. But these are questions you could have asked in any dimension and for any amount of supersymmetry. Um, the first question you could ask is, is maybe the simplest, which is just, is supersymmetry spontaneously broken in your theory? And if it's so, well, I'm going to call the theory null, because those, those theories kind of behave like zero in the far IR. At least they're, they behave like zero if you really only care about the supersymmetric ground states. Another question that high energy physicists have often asked is maybe you have a theory that where supersymmetry is not spontaneously broken because of some fine tuning. And you, but maybe you could trigger a, a spontaneous supersymmetry breaking by deforming the theory in a supersymmetric direction, by adding an operator to the, to the action. Um, the third question, which is the question I actually care about, is um, whether you could trigger spontaneous supersymmetry breaking by a large deformation to the theory, um, maybe by some path in the space of field theories. Maybe, maybe there's a path. For instance, I, I, I want to imagine paths that are, for instance, allowed to flow backwards up against the RG flow, um, meaning that anything that that is above you under RG flow is something you're allowed to flow to, you're allowed to flow back down, you're allowed to, to form, always preserving supersymmetry. Can you get to something with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking? If that's possible, I'm gonna call your theory null homotopic because it's homotopic to a null one. Now I wanna flag that, that these questions, especially question three about null homotopy, this depends very sensitively. Whether a theory counts as null homotopic depends on how I've topologized the space of quantum field theories, and really on what, I, what analytic decisions I make about quantum field theories. Um, I, I will focus on the case where I have quantum field theories. Oh, before I say this, let me just say that, that um, this question of kind of deforming where you maybe flow down to an IR and then back up against the RG flow. Um, I know that Zyberg calls that the, the condensed matter topology on the space of field theories, or he, so because I consider two theories kind of deformation equivalent if they're the same IR. So anyway, so um, what I was going to say is I want to, I need to be careful about, about analytic questions and I can't be as a mathematician. We don't even have a definition of one of 2D quantum field theory at all. So I'm going to say kind of what I think the analytic questions should, should be roughly. So roughly speaking, I want to work with, with compact quantum field theories. My, my working definition of compact is that the, the Wick rotated partition function, the Euclidean partition function, should converge absolutely uniformly um, to an analytic function. Uh, and and it would be really great if we could do enough analysis to, to get some to get that really precise. 
Uh, and the, roughly the topology is called, it would be something like the strong convergence of the resolvent of the Hamiltonian. This is a topology in which eigenvalues can go off to infinity, in which case the corresponding eigenvector just disappears from the theory. Um, and, and the reason I want this compactness condition is because I believe that if I asked these questions for non-compact theories, then the whole space of non-compact theories would be contractible. I believe that every theory would, be, would connect to zero. Um, under a deformation. So to make this really kind of hands-on, let me just work through an example, which is an example that, that's kind of a textbook example from, um, the, so I'm sure most of you are, are, are gonna be able to do it very, maybe even faster than, I, than me. So I could start with a free scalar multiplet. So let me remind you that means that I have a, a full boson and it's right moving super partner. This is an example of a non-compact theory. I could add to this theory a left moving fermion or rather a Fermi multiplet, but it's, it's super partners auxiliary, so I'll leave it out. Still non-compact, but now I could deform the theory by turning on a super potential and the potential that I wanna choose is phi squared minus epsilon all times lambda, where, where epsilon is gonna be a parameter that I'm gonna vary. And with that deformation, this is now a compact, an example of a compact quantum field. So now we can study what happens at different values of epsilon. And when epsilon is negative, it's not too hard to show that this theory is null, supersymmetry spontaneously broken. When epsilon is positive, there are two massive vacua to this theory. And when epsilon is zero, the theory ends up flowing in the IR to a one, one minimal model. So this is, gives me a family of theories, an example of a family of theories. It's a, where if I run epsilon from plus infinity to minus infinity, you get a family that starts at a, at a theory with, with two massive vacuum, that in the IR is just a topological field theory uh, with two completely independent universes. And it, it deforms that through a critical, through a CFT back down to, to the a null theory. And I want you to imagine that deformation as being a cobordism. If you graph this function phi squared minus epsilon, you get a cobordism from empty set to, to um, two points. If you graph the fibers of that function. So the reason I wanted to, you to think about it as a, as a cobordism is because in general, cobordisms give a, a good way of producing null homotopies. They don't produce all null homotopies, I don't think, but they, they're a good way of producing null homotopies. Um, maybe they do produce all null homotopies actually. Well, anyway, um, so I'll, I'll say this a little too quickly, the, but um, let me remind something that I think maybe goes all the way back to Greg Moore's thesis, which is that um, in order to give a minimal supersymmetry, if you're going to write down a sigma model with minimal supersymmetry, the target manifold has to have some, some structure that enhances a spin structure. This, in mathematics, the structure is called a string structure. It's a, a quantum B field with a so that's the, the flux of a quantum V field. And it makes sense to talk about cobordisms, families of manifolds, where the topology is allowed to change, but um, just like the topology in this family of manifolds changed, um, from, if you look at the fibers, um, where the total space of the cobordism also has a string structure. What we argued with um, Edward and Davide was that if you have a, a cobordism with string structure, you can turn it into a homotopy of, of, quanta, of sigma models on the fibers. And the way you do that is just a, an enhancement of what I just, of the example I did where I, turn, I take the theory for the whole cobordism, turn on a left moving fermion, which will act as a Lagrange multiplier, turn on a super potential to, um, and that forces you onto the fibers of the cobordism. In particular, if, if I have a manifold, which is string null cobordin, meaning it's the boundary of another string manifold, then the corresponding sigma model is definitely null homotopic. And the example that we wanted to think about was the case of the round S3. Now it's it's a, a kind of not very hard computation to say see that the in, in kind of topology to see that the possible choices of string structure for the round S3 that there's basically Z of those, and um, and the far IR you can, can try to convince yourself is going to be uh, basically a supersymmetric WCW model where S3 is is behaving as the group manifold of SU2. That's why you get a WCW model. Um, and the, the string structure, the strength of the string structure ends up becoming the WCW level. So I might use those words interchangeably. And um, what happens is that when you have 
uh, the string structure being 24, or generally a multiple of 24, then this manifold is string null coordinate. Uh, very explicitly, it's string null coordinate by a punctured K3 surface. And so that implies that the WZW model, the supersymmetric WZW model, with a particular WZW level, with level divisible by 24, is no no homotopic. And our question was, is this true um, for other values of K? Well, where, we, where you, in topology, you can prove that there's not a topological, like there's not a cobordism that would give you a no homotopy, but maybe there's a quantum no homotopy. So that was our motivating question. So now let me tell you, spend most of the talk telling you about the way we solved the question. So um, how would you show that a theory is not null homotopic? Well, the way you'd have to do it is you'd have to, so to find a deformation invariant, meaning something that doesn't change as you move around the moduli space of field theories, which is not zero for your object and zero for the null object. And there's a very famous example of such a deformation invariant for these um, minimally supersymmetric 1 plus 1 B theories, which uh, I think I will call the Witten index, although in topology it would be called the Witten genus, and then maybe some people call it the elliptic genus. Uh, the definition I'm going to take is that, um, and this is up to some normalization conventions that you have to pick, but the definition is, uh, or a definition, is that this is the Wick rotated so the Euclidean partition function of your theory on flat tori with, with non-bounding spin structure, meaning that the spin structure on the world sheet is remoned in every direction. So although this is a very familiar object, I want to remind, I want to review it, so its basic facts because they're, uh, I'm going to extend those. So a priori, this, my, in my definition, this is a function on the moduli space of flat tori maybe an analytic function if you can do the analysis correctly for quantum field theories. Well, the space of flat tori is three real dimensional. It um, has the two complex, like it has the complex structure, which is two real dimensions. I'll call it, I'll polarize them to be tau and tau bar. And there's also the area of the torus. And maybe there's some analytic properties like that in the tau to I infinity limit, it should not blow up too badly. Like get a pole con constrained by the, the Zemologic of C function. So although a priori this is a function of three variables, in fact, very famously, it's a function of only one variable. It's a modular function, a holomorphic modular function. So let me remind why that's true. Um, and, and I know you're going to all be bored. You're going to all zone out, but, but bear with me. So the reason why this is a function only of the variable tau and not of tau bar in the area is, um, well, there's various ways to see that, but the way, the argument I want to use is, is from the path integral, where if you deform, if you ask what's the derivative say in tau bar, in general, if you ask what's the derivative of the partition function under something where you change the geometry of the world sheet, the answer is always the, up to some proportionality factor, always the one point function of a stress energy tensor. That's the, that's the definition of stress energy tensor. So if I deform in the tau bar direction, I get the z bar z bar component of the stress energy tensor. If I deform in the area, I get something proportional to the z z bar component of the stress energy tensor. And the supersymmetry algebra tells me that these two components of the stress energy tensor are each super derivatives. I mean, they're each, they're each SUSY exact. Um, and, and since I'm only in minimal supersymmetry, the, the ZZ component is not SUSY exact. But these two are. And then the point that I want to emphasize is that for a compact quantum field theory, um, the one point function in, in working in this, this non bounding spin structure, the one point function of anything SUSY exact ends up being zero. So that proves that's the reason why this, this Witten index is a, a holomorphic modular form, or technically a weakly holomorphic modular form, because it can blow up with, a, with the pole at, at tau equals i infinity. So that's the first basic fact about the Witten index. The second basic fact is that it's not just a modular form, but it's actually an integral modular form. So the standard argument for this goes, or a standard argument goes, Let's break the manifest modularity by choosing a small A cycle and a long B cycle. And then in, in that limit, you can recognize the Q expansion of this modular form as the, a supersymmetric index, as a count of SUSY ground states for a quantum mechanics model. 
Um, and then it, you get integrality for the, the, the Q expansion. And the S1 equivariance just counts the order, uh, the power of Q. Since integers cannot deform, this function, which was a, a priori just a function from the space of quantum field theories of SQFTs to the space of integral modular forms, well, it must be a locally constant function because, because the space of integral modular forms is discrete like the integers are. And so this must be a, a deformation invariant. And so if you have a theory with non-zero at an index, it definitely cannot be null homotopic. Unfortunately, the theory I care about has trivial with an index, so this doesn't solve my problem. But it was a good first guess. Okay, so although, so I'll, I'll come back to, to my invariant, but I want to continue to explore this Witten index a little bit because it'll be what we thought through to come up with our invariant. So let's ask now. This used my argument used some compactness. It used very like it, we use well definedness of these functions, um, and it, and this. So, so I can ask, what happens if y is, if my field theory that I'm trying to evaluate the Witten index of is not compact? Well, if it's badly non-compact, remember my definition of compactness was that partition functions uh, converge absolutely. So they're, they're very well defined. If you have a badly non-compact quantum field theory, then there's just no reason for partition functions to, to converge at all, um, you know, for the, the integrals to converge or however you want to write them. Um, so, so you just don't have a well-defined Witten index at all. This is part of why you might think, like, why in some examples the Witten index can jump in a family of, of non-compact theories because it can just pass through somewhere where the Witten index isn't even defined at all. But the case, another case that's interesting to consider is what I'll call kind of mild non-compactness, where um, an example of a mildly non-compact theory is um, the cigar model, the cigar signal model, and in general. I want to think about theories where you, where you have. And I should emphasize not all of my theories are sigma models, but I want to. I'm going to like use language as if they are. So I want to imagine theories where there's some interesting part of the the field theory, and then there's a sort of cylindrical end that looks like some other theory that I'll call X, just times the real numbers. The the definition we use for this is that. I could take a theory and maybe select some interesting observable, capital phi. For any observable, it makes sense to talk about the fibers of that observable by turning on a, uh, by adding in a, a, a fermions via Lagrange multiplier, turning on a superpotential. And then it makes sense to ask if the theory, then maybe I'll say y has cylindrical ends x if I can find some observable phi such that the fibers of phi are null for epsilon very negative and um, x for epsilon very positive. And I'll just write this as the boundary of theory at y is theory x. I want to emphasize you should think of this as a boundary in field space. This is not a boundary on the world sheet. So if you do have cylindrical ends, and if the partition function of the x theory is 0, then the contribution of the partition function from this long end looks like 0 times the volume of the real numbers, um, which we can set to 0. Um, and we get a conditionally convergent partition function. Uh, so conditionally convergent with an index. And if I define this just in terms of like a, a partition function for a torus, it's still manifestly modular. Uh, but it might depend again on the, the um, both complex and anti-complex structures of the, of the world sheet. It might be real analytic rather than holomorphic. So let's let's probe, is it really real analytic? Let's run the argument again. So part of the argument just compiles. If I try to ask what's the derivative of the partition function with respect to the tau bar direction, that's still just the expectation value of inserting the z bar, z bar component of the stress energy tensor. And that's still proportional to something, the expectation value of something Suzy exact. But now the problem is whether the expectation values of Suzy exact functions do or don't vanish. Well, why did they vanish before? It's because Suzy exactness is sort of like being a total derivative. That's how you should think about it in the path integral. And so, um, so what you should expect is that if you have an end, if you have a boundary x, then instead of, of the expectation values of something Suzy exact being zero, you'd get a boundary term. Like in a, in a Stokes theorem type statement. 
So this was our our argument. We we didn't try in the paper to to make this argument completely. Like we didn't try to handle a lot of details that you might worry about in quantum field theory to make the, the argument really compile. Although I think one could do that. And in a paper from the spring, um, uh, Edward and a couple of collaborators who I'm forgetting um, worked in much more carefully in the Sigma model case. Um, but but we just checked a bunch of examples to get the, the proportionality correct. And what we, what we claim is that the tau bar derivative of the of the Witten index for these theories of cylindrical lens um, times the Dedekind function of tau times minus the square root, sorry, sorry, the square root of minus eight of the imaginary part of tau, that that's the expectation value of the z-bar component of the supersymmetry in the boundary. Um, and this is still wrong up to some powers of the square root of, of the fourth root of minus one that really depend on the conventions you like for supersymmetry algebras. Uh, there's a similar formula for the dependence on the area, which will be the Z component of the supersymmetry algebra in the boundary. Now this component vanishes if the boundary theory is super conformal. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm only gonna assume that the boundary theory is super conformal so that I can ignore the area dependent. So I really don't have an area dependent function. So I wanna say this is a function, this is a, a holomorphic anomaly equation. This is saying that, that um, the Witten index of Y is not a holomorphic modular form. It's a real analytic modular form with a prescribed holomorphic anomaly. And um, this is basically like a kind of a MOS form. It's a, a, a version of a Mach modular form. So I'll say that on the next slide, I think, yeah. So in addition to being mo modular net before and now kind of, you know, modular, well, real analytic modular with prescribed holomorphic anomaly now. Uh, in, the, in the compact case, we said that the Q expansion was integral. Uh, any nice enough real analytic modular form has a Q expansion. Um, the way you do it is you, you, well, you analytically continue, and then you take the limit as tau bar goes to minus infinity. This limit just completely breaks modularity. Just it really breaks it, unless you were already holomorphic. And then you, but, but you can still talk about the Q expansion of this no longer modular, whole, but now holomorphic function F. Um, and, and this function F is, is what is basically a, what's called a generalized Mach modular form. Generalized Mach modular forms are the same pretty much as analytically nice uh, real analytic modular forms. You can go back and forth between the functions I'm calling F and F hat. And, um, so anyway, this, this Q expansion in this case, you can still recognize as a supersymmetric index. And so it's still integral. Actually, there's a footnote that I'm not gonna emphasize, um, which is that there's some X dependent shift to integrality that has to do with the Tiapoto de Singer um, invariance. So our conclusion is that when um, Y is an SQFT with cylindrical ends X and when X is super conformal, then this limit is uh, basically an integral generalized Mach modular form. And the holomorphic anomaly is called in the Mach modular forms literature called the shadow of that um, Mach modular form. And again, we checked this carefully in, a, in a, um, some, some sort of non-trivial examples. So contrapositively, if you only know X, then you know the shadow of the Mach modular form that, it, that so that you, if you only know X, you could ask, can X be filled? And filling X would be the same as producing a null homotopy of X, because if you had a null homotopy, you could compile it into a film. So if you only know X, you can compute the shadow, you can compute the shift of integrality, and then you can ask, does there exist an integral Mach modular form with that shadow? And the answer is usually not. If you just write down some random function G, which you want to be the shadow of a, of a Mach modular form, well, it's always the shadow of a Mach modular form with, of a generalized Mach modular form with, um, with complex Q expansion, C Q expansion, but it's often not the shadow of something with integral Q expansion. And there's an explicit abstraction to it being in the shadow and it lives in this specific group. The, the, the group is the quotient of complex valued Q series modulo Z valued Q series plus um, complex value module, polymorphic modular forms. Um, and our, again, our theorem in quotes, because we didn't check some details, but we gave, I think, a good argument um, 
Okay, so our, our claim, if I, was in, if I were giving a math talk, I'd call it our conjecture, is that, um, that this obstruction really is a deformation of the boundary theory X. Um, and and it, we call it a secondary elliptic genus or the secondary Witten index. I'm gonna use those words interchangeably um, because it came from, from applying. So in general, in topology, there's not a precise notion of what secondary invariants are in topology, but usually you just call something a secondary invariant when it comes from pretending that you had a filling and um, applying your primary invariant to the filling to the to the null homotopy. So let me go back to the motivating example. So remember that that at least in the far IR, I cared about the round three sphere with with string structure um, of strength k, and and in the far IR that was a WZW model with WZW level k. Um, the supercurrent is has a standard form. It's basically a trilinear in the fermions with a specific proportionality factor and then something proportional to uh, boson fermion combination um, the boson fermion combination will never be able to soak up all three of the um, fermion zero modes and so it won't have a one point function and so the the one point function of the supercurrent is just um, well there's a proportionality factor then um, each of the Fermions gives you a factor of, Dedekind, of the Dedekind zeta function of tau bar because they're right moving fermions. And then there's the residual, the bosonic part of the WW model, which just contributes the partition function of the WZW model. And um, this is supposed to be the shadow of an integral mock, of a mock modular form. And very conveniently, um, Harvey Murthy and Nazaraglu, for other reasons, had already written down uh, um, an explicit mock modular form with this shadow. And um, so if you take their explicit mock modular form and compute with it for a while, you can figure out what class it is in my, in my, um, in my group. So you can figure out the obstruction to this um, theory having a null homotopy. And that class is, is K on 24. Um, the, the factor the denominator 24 really comes from this, this, um, uh, it really comes from from the C two, the C two part. So um, so the conclusion here is that since this is K on twenty four modulo integers um, and modulo modular forms, um, and so the conclusion is that S three is not null homotopic when you're not at string structure divisible by twenty four. Um, and and so that was that was our result. So um, for the last, I guess I get 10 minutes left, let me say just a few things about why we did this and what my, what my mathematical motivations were. Um, so the, the, what was going on for us thinking about it is that there's a, a large open conjecture mathematically, um, which has one version of it, I think, has been due to Stoltz and Teichner, but they were building on work of, of Witten, Siegel, and Hopkins, and others. And the conjecture is the following. The Witten index, we, that we, the original, the primary Witten index, um, that was a map from, the way I set it up was a map from, from supersymmetric quantum field theories in minimal super, you know, 0, 0,1 super um, SQFTs to integral modular forms. And the conjecture is that this index has a topological refinement that I'm gonna call the, the topological Witten index, which lands not in modular forms, but in a, a topological enhancement of modular forms called very um, creatively topological modular forms. Um, topological modular forms, so modular forms are a ring. Topological modular forms are not a ring. They're a much more homotopic object. They're, a, they're what's called a ring spectrum or equivalently a, a generalized cohomology theory. Um, and so that's the first part of the conjecture is that, the, that there is such an enhancement. TMF is a well-defined mathematical object. The second part of the conjecture, which is the part I, that's I think most exciting, is that actually this topological Witten index should be a complete invariant if you topologize SQFTs correctly. Like the first, the sort of this natural topology that I was telling you about at the beginning. Meaning that the space of SQFTs 
So I should say the space of SKTs is naturally a spectrum. It's not just a topological space. And the, 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 the conjecture is that the space of SQFTs, it's naturally a spectrum. The conjecture is it's equivalent to this spectrum from mathematics called topological natural life forms. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of too quickly tell you the, the rough mathematical definition of topological modular forms. I want to emphasize topological modular forms exists mathematically. The cons its only description right now in mathematics is totally algebraic. Uh, and, and uses some pretty hard derived algebra. So one of the reasons why a topologist would be really excited, why I'm really excited about this conjecture is because it offers an analytic model of this, this object on um, topological modular forms. And there's a very analogous story with K-theory where, um, and where having analytic models of K-theory, especially ones that come from physics, is, is very useful for doing mathematics. But, Currently, the only definition in mathematics, I'll tell you a sort of bird's eye view of the definition. So modular forms, their definition is that you, you take the stack of, of elliptic curves. This stack has a graded vector bundle that I'm just going to call V, whose, whose graded components are powers of the, um, the Lie algebra of the elliptic curve. Um, this vector bundle, its fibers um, are the coefficients of some of a cohomology theory called e elliptic cohomology, and then Gorse, Hopkins, Miller, and Lurie worked really hard to to produce um, to enhance this from rather than just being a stack of vector bundles to really get a stack of cohomology theories whose um, whose fibers really were e elliptic cohomology, and they had to basically invent derived stacks and derived elliptic curves to do this. But at the end of a lot of hard work, then we do have a derived stack of elliptic curves, a bundle of spectra on it whose fibers are elliptic homology. And by definition, topological modular forms is the, the global sections of that bundle of cohomology theories of, of spectra. Um, and so that's that's the algebraic definition. It's, and it's like, the problem is that this, I, I emphasize it's algebraic because we don't have any like modular forms have an have analytic models. They're they're like the moduli stack of elliptic curves is an analytic object. It's kind of complex tori if you want. Whereas um, derived elliptic curves really don't. They really only exist in in algebraic geometry. Um, so that's that was the big conjecture that 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 led us to this. And um, the map from the the map from TMF to modular forms. Um, is quite well computed. It's quite well understood in, in, in topology. Um, and so if you believe this conjecture, then you would say that the map from SQFTs to modular forms is also quite well understood. And what we know is that it's it's not an isomorphism. Um, it is an isomorphism after tensoring with a complex number. So that means that the only thing that it fails to be an isomorphism on is torsion stuff, is, is elements who, when you add them to themselves enough times, you get to zero. Um, and Bunke and Nauman had already written down, using algebraic topology, they'd written down what they called the secondary Witten genus for, for CMF classes. Um, and they, they computed it for S3 with string structure K and showed it was non-zero except for when K was divisible by 24. And that's why, and then what we were doing with Davide was, was to um, try to understand their invariant using physics constructions. Their invariant made no explicit reference to mock modularity. And I think, um, and, but I'm pretty sure that we wrote down a version of their invariant. I'm working with Dan Berwick Evans to, to give a, a proof of that. That's a kind of mathematical proof. Or rather, um, we're going to try to write down Bunka Nauman's invariant in a way that makes explicit reference to mock modularity. And I want to mention that there's, there's, um, the secondary invariant still misses some of the torsion in CMF. There's still things in CMF that are not seen that we don't know how to see very well in topology. And so similarly, that means I don't have any clue how to see them in physics. So I have a, an, a, an invitation to all the physicists, which is um, the group manifolds. If you take if you take a group manifold SU3, spin five or G2, and take the corresponding sigma model for that group manifold. So again, this will flow to some, some WCW model. Um, and I want the basically the level one theory. Um, so this is where the, you use the string structure that comes from the 
left invariant framing. So those classes in TMF are known to be non-zero, but proving that's hard. Um, and the, so the question is, can to find an invariant of, of quantum field theories to show that the corresponding sigma models um, are not null homotopic. So um, anyway, I'll just end by saying something too, too brief and too vague which is another reason why I was really thinking about this stuff um, and where I'd love people to, to give me ideas. Um, as I said, this, this, these null homotopies of interest in quantum field theories, that actually gives you a source for integral mock modular forms. And you could, of course, do this all with a flavor symmetry, and then you'd get mock modular forms that are valued in characters of G. And and we have 30 years of experience knowing that 2D quantum field theory um, is good for explaining modularity in moonshine, in, in, including the original monstrous moonshine. And in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of interest in mock modular moonshines and umbral moonshines. So um, my, my hope is that this might help explain the, the mock modularity in umbral moonshines. There's a little bit more to being moonshine that's not just modularity. When you say something's moonshine, you, you know, it's easy to write down modular functions, modular forms. Um, to say something's moonshine, you have to have a, a genus zero or optimal growth type condition. So some very strict control over the behavior of the functions of the cusps. And um, in the case of, of Umbral moonshine, I think the best way to say this would be um, to, to work with what you might call topological cusp forms. Topological cusp forms are an object that does exist in topology. Uh, and I don't know any physics that would explain it. And so um, this, will, this will be the end of my talk. I just want to put an open question, which is what physics, first of all, what physics gives strongly holomorphic modular forms? The, the Witten index a priori is a weakly holomorphic modular form. It's allowed to blow up at, at q equals zero um, with a pole. And even more importantly, what physics gives topological, what gives cusp forms, gives functions that vanish at q equals zero. Um, if we could come up with some natural space of field theories that that where the precision for the Witten index were always always cusp, that would um, really I think help to explain um, things like topological cusp forms. So um, thank you for your attention. Let's thank Theo. Um, Edward, you have a question? The title suggests that my question might be answered by the last paper. My question was, uh, what are the manifolds? My question is, what are the manifolds with boundary that are supposed to be relevant to umbral moonshine? Uh, this is a deep question. And um, let me say that I don't, let me, the answer is, uh, so let me say that what I what I've kind of have a proposal for is only the A1 version of Umbral Moonshine, only only the original Messy Moonshine. And it's just a proposal. I don't have uh, like there's some aspects of it I don't know. Um, in the first paper I mentioned on this slide, on the, the holomorphic SCFT's paper with, with Davide, we um, kind of studied some interesting theories where where we certainly I could just say this as a general thing. There are plenty of, of field theories where um, you don't know any sigma model description of the field theory. And um, it's, if you believe that, that SQFTs are, are, are the same as TMF classes, then it's a hard theorem of Mike Hopkins. Well, there's a theorem of Mike Hopkins that says every manifold, every TMF class can be represented by a manifold. Um, not canonically, but um, I don't know how to reproduce any argument like that. His, his proof is like by just computing things. Um, and so, so what I think for Umbral Moonshine, 
The naive guess for Umbral Moonshine, which I think is wrong, and which I argue is wrong in, in, my, in my recent paper, is that you should be kind of really studying punctured K threes. And um, I'm pretty sure that, that that by itself ain't good enough. What's the and main I, that anyway? Uh, so as, as sort of we talked about in, in um, our paper with Davide, if you take a K3 and puncture 24 times, yes. um, you can put a string structure one around each of those punctures. Mm -hmm. And if you flow those punctures to the, to the WZW, the, those spheres to the WZW limit, what you, you do just get the, um, the mock modular form, that K3 surface, punctured K3 surface itself just does produce the mock modular form from Matsu Moonshine because it's a version of the elliptic genus of a K3 surface. Um, so that was great. Now this is supposed to have something to do with M24. And um, the, the natural thing then to do would be to try to permute those 24 spheres those 24 punctures. You certainly couldn't do that permutation at the level of manifolds, but you maybe you can do it with kind of more quantum theory objects. And the, then if you actually try to do that, you find out that the, um, when you actually try to do that, then it doesn't work. Like the, the you don't get the right mock modularity that's predicted in umbral motion. Um, what I actually think the right answer is that, so I don't know what the bulk theory, what the sort of filling theories should be. What I, what I have is a guess for what the boundary theory that, that should be fillable would be. Yes. Um, and rather than being related to um, kind of 24 copies of an S3, I think it should be related to John Duncan's um, super moonshine theory, um, the F natural. VF natural is a unifying object for all of the Metsu groups, all of the, the Umbral Moonshine groups, because it has a Conway symmetry. And you could try to see if like some version of it is, is no homotopic. And that, that's my proposal in the paper. Um, this gets into the difference between, so the, maybe I, I'm saying things that are too, too vague, but the, um, if you're not doing topological objects, there's no real difference between cusp forms and strongly holomorphic modular forms. Any, the, the, the spaces of cusp forms and strongly holomorphic modular forms are isomorphic by multiplying by um, Dedekind's delta, by, sorry, by delta. Um, there is no modular, there is no topological modular form delta. The smallest topological modular form uh, is like, instead of delta, there's 24 delta. And one of the costs of this is that topological cusp forms are just different from topological strongly holomorphic modular forms. They're just different spaces. They're, they're, and so um, you can really tell the difference between sort of different, like you can, there's just very different conjectures about whether you're working with cusp forms or, I'm not saying things that are, that are clear, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Moore has a question, please unmute yourself. Hi, Theo. Um, Hi, so Greg. I wanted to, to make sure I understood properly. You, your mock modular forms are not quite the same as the mock modular forms is in the definition of spheres. Is that correct? Um, well, there's sort of, the, I think the main thing to say is that, um, so there are at least three things that, so the most strict version of mock modular form, like if you look it up in kind of, I think Svegers and certainly Wikipedia would tell you that the shadow function should be maybe anti-holomorphic or the holomorphic anomaly itself should be anti-holomorphic so that you get some equivalence between mock modular forms and harmonic MOS forms. Exactly, yeah, that's where I was um, going. I was wondering if you had and, some analog of the ice. And, right, and so, um, then there's sort of an intermediate thing, which are called mixed mock modular forms, where the shadow is the dot product of a vector valued modular form with a vector valued, like the, with the complex conjugate of a vector valued modular form. So it's a finite sum of things like that. Okay, sure. And then the most general thing is just generalized mock modular forms where the, the shadow could be any real analytic function. Okay, so the shadow um, could 
loss form or something like that. Right. So a priori, our, our invariance uses arbitrary real analytic modular functions. I see. Um, I see. But, but this is just a question about the boundary theory. It's just a question about the theory I was calling X and not a question right. about the filling Y. And so if X itself happens to be, remember my invariant really isn't like, I need to do more to tell you my invariant when X wasn't super conformal anyway. So when X is rational, then you're in the mixed mock modular case. Right. And when X is anti-holomorphic, then you're in the pure mock modular case. Right, right. And so for instance, in my, in my Matthew Moonshine paper, I, I propose a specific X, which is anti-holomorphic. And so really would give the specific, like at least it has the right, you know, at least it, it does produce pure modular, mock modular forms for that example. And in the case that we, that I told you on the slide, it was about mixed modular forms because the shadow was rational. Okay, okay. I had another question. I, Go ahead. I, I know you've explained this to me before, but I could, I could use, I, it would be useful for me to hear it again, and maybe other people too. Could you explain why the space of um, supersymmetric quantum field theories, zero one theories, is is a, a loop spectrum? I think you said it's you said it's a spectrum. Is it? It's a loop spectrum. Yeah, it's um, so. Um, sorry, my my iPad went asleep, so I'm surprised that it's still displaying. Um, so. I should first say that that every author seems to have a different definition of like use the word spectrum slightly different. There's all these different models of spectrum. So um, we claim it's a spectrum in the way that in the sense that that NLAB call uses for spectrum and that Wikipedia calls an omega spectrum. And maybe you're calling a loop spectrum, which is that that the the loop space of one piece. So what is a spectrum? A spectrum is a sequence of spaces, and then there should be some relation between the um, the each space and either the loops of the next space or the suspension of the previous space. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and the difference between different models is exactly how strict you want that relation to be. And I think a loop spectrum is one where each space is homotopy equivalent to the loops of the next space. Okay. So the spaces here are spaces of field theories with prescribed gravitational anomaly. The gravitational anomaly in, in 2D is takes sort of takes integer value or half integer values, and I can I can prescribe the anomaly, and that gives me my sequence of spaces. Um, and then in one direction, so what would a loop be? Well, it would be a family of theories that starts at a null theory, walks around, and then comes back to a null theory. So if you have such a family. You could try to, to so that had some some parameters along the loop. You could try to dynamicalize that parameter, and okay, there's some an analysis that would need to be done. But our our claim is that the results of that dynamicalization process, because you started and ended at kind of with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, the result of that would be again compact, because it's like basically a compact. It's like the integral of a compactly supported function. Um, in the other direction, it's really easy. If you have a theory, you can um, do my Lagrange multiplier trick with the function um, with the function zero. So, which is to say, you can take your theory, put on a, a um, turn on a um, fermion to be the Lagrange multiplier, turn on a superpotential, which is just epsilon times lambda, um, and now you've got a family of theories where you just and um, except for when epsilon is zero, that family has supersymmetry spontaneously broken. And so I had a family that like lived at, at, at null, jumped through my theory, and then go back to null. And then you have to convince yourself that these two maps are homotopy equivalent. Or, exactly. Uh, homotopy yeah. Homotopy right. That was. Equivalent. Yeah. Indeed. So I mean, is it is it easy to see that's a homotopy equivalent? One of the two compositions is easy. If you start with a theory, turn on, like do the stupid thing to get a family and then integrate back out, that obviously gets you back to your original theory. Um, up to some, I mean, it doesn't have to be the original theory in the notes. It has to be deformation equivalent to the original theory. Um, so that, that composition is easy. 
the other composition is um, would require that I be more careful with my with a lot of analytic issues about what I mean by families of theories. Um, and I am like, one question you could ask is if you have like, maybe you have a family of theories. First of all, I, I don't really wanna even imagine that my theories always have like Lagrangian field theoretic descriptions, but maybe maybe they do. And then you could ask like, as, the fa as you move along the family, are at least the field content the same all the time, or maybe the field content itself is allowed to jump. But probably you could always make the field content be the same all the time, just by like, if you have some fields for some along the family, but for some piece of the family, just extend it to the rest of the family, but make it very massive. And if you can do something like that, then I think there's an argument that can be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hank Chan, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. So thank you, Theo, for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm not like, um, there's this uh, proposal, right, by uh, Douglas and uh, his co-author where he tries to um, propose a geometric uh, realization of TMFs in terms of bundles of uh, boundary conditions. This is um, or, Douglas and Enriquez, I think. It, yes, yeah. is that mm -hmm. what you're thinking of? Yes, I, I yes, know that paper yes. quite well. Right, okay. So I guess there's a connection between what you're proposing as the analytic model for TMFs and their proposal. That's exactly, well, I don't, So, so one of the things that I'm aware of that, that Andre and Chris, I'm only really aware of one paper of Andre's and Chris's about proposing models of TMF and it's their, their one about um, super conformal nets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I, my, what I sort of think that they're doing is they have the same conjecture I have that, um, TMF should have an analytic model as some version of quantum field theory, of, of the space of super symmetric quantum field theories. And now there's like a math question, which is to write down mathematical definition of quantum field theory. And I think that um, definitions in terms of nets of Neumann algebras like they use are, are um, probably not the final definition, but very close to giving a, a mathematical definition of quantum field theory. I think that, mm -hmm. that Andre in particular has a, some really good ideas of what, I mean, I've talked to Andre more than I've talked to Chris, but I think mm -hmm. they, they're, so one of the issues is that, that in the papers that they look at, they're only looking at, at like they look at sort of defining conformal field theory rather or super conformal field theory rather than quantum field theory. Right. Um, and, and this is this is reasonable at a like for what we can do. Kind of I think we're close to having a complete definition of conformal field theory in, in one plus one B and quantum field theory is still a ways off. But um, in, it's important if you actually tried to make like you could have conjectured. TMF would be modeled by super conformal field theories, um, mm -hmm. by, this, by some space of super conformal field theories. And this conjecture is kind of definitely false. The space of conformal field theories is probably like, if you're in a space of conformal field theories, you, you roughly, at least if sort of generically, you think that maybe there's only finitely many directions that you can move around the space of conformal field theories. And um, on the other hand, you could have tried, well, now there's a question that, that um, I don't know the answer to. So you could imagine starting at any quantum field theory and flowing down to the far right, IR right. and hoping to mm -hmm. hit a conform. And so, so you could try, and this is like a Zimologic C theorem tells you that that's roughly a Morse flow down to some kind of critical locus. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you could try to use the, the conformal field theories as a way of understanding through kind of Morse theory um, a way of understanding the space of all quantum field theories. Mm -hmm. But then okay, you have to yeah. just understand what, it, what the kind of 
flows, kind of what the RG flows from a, a UV CFT to an IR CFT are. And you have right. to kind of work okay. that into the topology. So mm-hmm. this sounds great. I would love for that to work. I see no reason why it doesn't, except that um, I also see no reason for the IR. Like, I, it's important that you always stay in compact theories. And mm-hmm. um, I think the experts seem to believe that if you started a compact theory, the far IR might decompactify. Right. And that's where and, the elasticity becomes yeah. important. And so that would that would bother me. I mean, in particular, yeah. So mm-hmm. um, I, I, every expert, like every time I visit somebody, every time I get to talk one-on-one with sort of a, an expert, I, I try to get their, them to answer this question for me. <laughs> and, and the naive guess is always, yes, it can decompactify. In fact, the naive guess is always you just start with a, with a surface of high genus and write down the sigma model, and of course it's going to decompactify. Mm-hmm. And when you try to run that argument really carefully, well, that wasn't UV complete until you UV complete it, and maybe something <coughs> funny happens when you UV complete it. But these are questions I don't know the answer to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's interesting how like the actual elasticity will affect the topology at the end. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah. but but also somehow you should expect it. So um, a lot of the like the, the there's a baby version of this conjecture, which is a theorem about K theory, which says that K theory has a model in terms of the space of minimally supersymmetric quantum mechanics models. Is it the, are you talking about operator K theory or? Sure. That's, I mean, what you might call topological K theory. So mm-hmm. my, now my computer realized that my um, right. iPad was asleep, so I'm going to turn it off. Um, so, um, so topological K theory, either KU or KO, can be modeled in terms of the space of uh, quantum mechanics models. Um, there mm-hmm. are multiple models like that. What's a quantum mechanics model? It's for this uh, for this version, it should be basically some some type of Hilbert space with some type of of uh, Hamiltonian. And there's right, all sorts of analytic right. questions you have to ask about the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonians mm-hmm. are almost always unbounded. Um, you, so this is a theorem when you say the right adjectives, when you say the right analytic adjectives, there are multiple choices for those adjectives, but not all choices work. And you do have to set the adjectives correctly. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to try to fit in another question or two before the top of the hour. I remind everybody to please email Jeff if you want to go into either the session one room or the session two room at the top of the hour. Uh, But I'll keep moderating questions here in this room for Theo as long as that's possible. And let's have a question from Shariar. Uh, Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Thank you. And a statement about the session for letting uh, Jeff Morgan know, do we have to email him or just do it in the chat? I I think in chat. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, the question is about, uh, well, thanks. Uh, It's a uh, a very nice talk. The question is about uh, TMFs. Um, In the classical case, there is an action of Hecke operators on cusp forms. And uh, the Mm -hmm. cusp forms, which are Hecke eigen, those are very special because um, there's uh, L functions associated with them and motives associated with them. And yeah. a Hecke operator can actually be thought of very geometrically as a correspondence on uh, the modular stack, as you yes. said. So because of this uh, definition as a correspondence, it seems that one can get a action of uh, Hecke operators on these topological modular forms as well, as yes. a factor of some derived category. So is, is it known? And uh, are the TMS, which are Hecke eigen, if that makes sense, um, are they more special than the other ones? Uh, so parts are known and parts are, I think, haven't even been considered yet, to my knowledge. So let me try to say what, what, does, what I'm aware of. Um, so now, maybe 13 years ago, um, Nora Ganser explains that, and, and also, um, um, well, certainly Nora's papers are, are some of the better, one, best ones. Um, that um, so she was looking at Devoto elliptic homology. So that's basically um, equivariant elliptic homology for finite groups with um, 
but complex, complex analy- like complexified. So not seeing the, the integral integral structure. Mm-hmm. And she explained that Hecke operators there are extremely closely related to um, to atom, are basically are kind of power operators or basically atoms operators for CMF. Um, and so let me ask she, she was sort of interested in that for from like what she was interested in was questions about moonshine and, and about kind of re- replicability in moonshine. Um, the integral stuff, I think a little bit has been done for for heck operators on weekly holomorphic TMF classes. Uh, topological cusp forms, I'm only aware of one paper where they've even been mentioned. Most of what I know about them comes from kind of reading unpublished papers and drafts by, by various experts in algebraic topology. So mm-hmm. I just think that the topologists simply have not explored cusp forms. I see. Thanks. Uh, the the atom. Uh, so the the analog of uh, Hecke operators. Do they satisfy? Uh, so Hecke operators satisfy the property that um, Hecke operator for well, first of all, Hecke operators are parameterized by integers, and if you take uh, the composition of Hecke operator for n times a Hecke mm-hmm. operator for m, they it, it's equal to Hecke operator for n times m. I mean, they're multiplicative. Right. That's the word. So these uh, atom operations also satisfy uh, this multiplicative uh, multiplicative property. You'd have to look into the literature. This is not my my expertise. I, I also see in the chat that David says they're related to permutation or defaults of powers of the theory, and this is exactly where Nora's paper starts. That's why she was interested in it. Okay. I I think Adam's operations are multiplicative, but I don't completely remember. Uh, but let's move on to Pavel. If you have a question, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello. Uh, do you think it could be possible in principle to construct uh, like in a similar way some sort of tertiary uh, tertiary environments which would be kind of secondary environments to environments that you construct and would capture maybe capture some sort of torsion in TMF in degrees uh, two two model four, not not three model four, but two model four. Uh, I would love for that to work to get right down tertiary invariance. I failed when I tried. But it, 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 it was some sort of technical problem or more conceptual? Go um, ahead, Theo. Analyze your failure in detail. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's always hard to tell when you fail if it's just like a, your own personal sort of inability. So the problem is that um, to write down... So the, the secondary invariant of Bukhan Nauman um, has a beautiful description due to, to Dan Berwick Evans in terms of what Dan calls KMF or, or kind of K theoretic modular forms. And um, what you discover from, from like really from that description very is that um, what's going on really is an interplay between kind of the two properties that you know about the Witten index, namely the um, that it's modular and that it's integral. And either one of those doesn't give you an obstruction, doesn't like give you an interesting secondary invariant. Just, um, but, but when you play them off each other, you get a rich secondary invariant. If you knew a third property, it would be easy to write down a tertiary invariant by playing that off of it too. Another way of asking this question is, is um, our, our invariant, the way we described it, had to do with the one-point function of the supersymmetry operator. If you could tell me anything about that one-point function beyond that it was a real analytic modular form of some specific weight, um, if you could tell me anything more about it, if you could tell me some interesting integrality or some interesting anything, then we could try to, to, to play off of it. But all I, know, all I know about it is its weight as a modular form. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Mikola Dedeschenko. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um, my question is a little bit tangential to the main topic of your talk, but since you mentioned how to make sense of this um, cigar-like non-compactness, I wonder if there are any other types of non-compactness you know how to deal with, uh, specifically conical, for example? Non-compactness. Uh, I don't. Um, so is that really true? One of the things that that 
I mean, the short answer is no, I don't know how to make sense of things because I haven't thought them through carefully or I haven't even tried. The, um, the slightly less short answer is sometimes there's procedures that allow you to trade different types of comp non-compactness for each other. So there are ways like through like, so in the cigar case, you, one of the ways to construct the cigar is, is to start with just a flat, Plane, two-dimensional plane, the, the C, the complex line, and then do some procedure to it that converts it into a cigar, where you kind of do some, some Kähler reduction for the U1 action. And I could imagine similar procedures to trade different um, to other types of, of non-compactness. I don't know. Okay, sorry, thanks. Okay, let's thank Thea one more time. Uh, uh, sorry, you can unmute and join me in thanking him. And we now have breakout session. Uh, if you have not been assigned to one or, or w whatever, you still want to uh, express your preference, uh, you can send Jeff Murgan a chat and he'll put you in the correct room. Otherwise, I think you stay in the main room. Great. Thanks, Dave.
Hi, Bruce. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Okay, good. Thanks to you. Very good. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I missed the entire strings and string math. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, congratulations, though. It just looks like it's just, it, you've done a brilliant job. Thank you. Uh, just everybody's going to start piling back into the into the room, and then I'm going to close the meeting. Um, <clears throat> where are you now? In, in Germany or? No, I, I came. I'm in Stellenbosch. Yeah, I came back okay. uh, when when the when the lockdown started and all that. Okay. Yeah. You you at home, Cape Town? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I like your telescope in the corner there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I got it for for I got it for my son, and the oh, safest okay. place in the house is is away from from my kids. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Your house looks very sort of uh, classic academic with the wooden library. <laughs> yeah. What is that scroll certificate? Oh, it's uh, it's some I I I, I do calligraphy and it's, it's uh, something that I did years ago. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> let me see if everybody's in the room. Okay, um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I want to. This, I guess, is the official closing of the of the conference. Um, <clears throat> okay, great. So I want to I want to um, <clears throat> officially close the conference by uh, mentioning a few words of thanks to um, to everybody. Um, let me start by um, thanking uh, Amanda Weltman and Robert Demello Koch from um, the uh, both from South Africa uh, for their very generous funding for both strings and string math um, <clears throat> through the South African Research Chairs Program. Um, Frederick Skols um, at the Institute for, uh, at the National Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, Robert Dycrafts of the Institute um, for Advanced Study. Fernando Quevedo and Atish de Volker at ICTP. Martin Bridson and the Clay Mathematics Institute. Michael Douglas, Peter Svercek, um, Josh Lapan, and Vladimir um, Sadov all of whom um, made very generous personal contributions um, towards supporting young people to attend both String Math and um, Strings 2020 um, <clears throat> in Cape Town and Stellenbosch. Um, I, I want to also thank Ron Donaghy and Edward Witten for really driving the idea of having strings and string math in Cape Town. Um, and um, I should also mention uh, Dave Morrison, who was my office mate in um, in in 2016 um, at the Simons Institute, and and really pushed this idea of having string math as well um, in um, Cape Town. And I, I should say also that that uh, I, we tried to time it so that this would coincide very nicely with uh, Dave's birthday, um, which was this week. So happy birthday, Dave Morrison, as well. Um, <clears throat> Um, Edward Witten and Rhonda Nagy especially made an enormous effort to help us um, fundraising again, especially for young people to attend what would have been the in-person conference um, in, in Stellenbosch um, <clears throat> this year. Um, I, want to, I want to give special thanks to the local organizing committee um, uh, for the work that they put in in, in putting this together. Bruce Bartlett, um, Shajit Hawk, Nathan Moynihan, um, Ingrid Davitsky, Jonathan Schock, and Amanda Weltman. Um, and I want to, in particular, single out Nathan Moynihan, um, who, in addition to chairing this morning's session, 
um, has really worked tirelessly behind the scenes and made sure that the web page was up to date and changes were adapted as, as quick as possible, that videos were edited and uploaded with the, with the slides and they went up as, as, hum as quickly as humanly possible. And then finally, I really want to thank the speakers, the panelists, the session chairs, um, and to every single one of the, uh, at my last count, 641 participants that, that made String Math 2020 possible, I would like to say a very proudly South African um, thank you. <clears throat> and I hope very much that we will see you all in person next year um, for String Math 2021 in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And with that, I would like to um, officially close string, uh, string Math 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.